Sean Chapman. We are here as always to talk about stuff. This week on the show, we have a lot of stuff. Yes, there there is a lot of stuff going on. Yes, uh, I'll say right up front, Sean, you haven't seen Wonder Woman. No, I have been pretty busy over the past week or so, so I have not had time to, to go and, and check out the Wonder Woman movie, even though I'm really excited because all the reviews are great. But mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're not going to go into depth on that one, and I'm sorry about that. If you want to know more about it, I did write a review for the website. Go read that. It's spoiler free. You can read that. It's fine. I really love the movie. Um, in fact, it should tell you, because I wrote about it and I haven't written about a new movie in a couple of months, right. how strongly I felt about it, that I had to like get thoughts on paper. Um, which, funnily enough, I have reviewed every one of the DCEU movies. I didn't realize that. Yeah, but this seems like for very different reasons, reasons this time. Yes. Yeah. I had very strong feelings about all of them. I had, stronger, I had strong positive feelings about this one. And that's one of the things I want to say right up front, how amazingly disconnected that movie is from the DC. Okay. Like, yeah. there is a the minorest of references in one early scene that actually transitions into, I think, a good character thing for Wonder Woman. But other than that, like, there's no post credit scene. There's no little winks of, like, she's in World War One and sees someone, like, with a potion. Like, I'm going to become a villain or like, something. Or Flash just comes yeah. running through the timeline. It's like, ah, Justice League's going to come out later this year. <laughs> then he's gone. Yeah, no, nothing. Like, even most of the Marvel movies aren't this restrained with it. And Did Stan so, Lee just show up and, like, people didn't realize, like, wait, this is a DC movie. We don't need him to cameo in this one. Yeah, no, it, uh, you would think Stan Lee at some point would just start wandering onto other superhero yeah. sets. Yeah, no. But, uh, it's, I mean, it's a great movie. I think people are referencing, you know, the one I keep hearing people reference is Superman 78 and Christopher Reeve. Mm-hmm. And I think that is an accurate comparison for a lot of different reasons. It is just a great superhero movie and a great movie and... How cool and inspiring is it to see a female directed, led superhero movie breaking a hundred million at the box office, doing this well, being this loved? That to me signifies a lot of doors being opened, right? And that's cool. Yeah, it turns out when you give a female director the same budget in marketing you give a male director, they make fucking money. Yeah, like as long as they're talented, like it yeah. doesn't fucking. Yeah, it's not that necessarily no female director has been given. An opportunity somewhat similar to this before. They just haven't been given the support behind it yeah. and have been set up to fail a la I mean, Lexi Alexander like with Punisher. Yeah, or like there's not like, you know, Wonder Woman is like the most premier of fucking uh, superhero franchises you could yeah. possibly work for. Yeah. It's compared to like the Punisher where people kind of know who the Punisher yeah. is, but that's not really, that's not the same kind of opportunity that Wonder Woman is, nor is like a Catwoman movie or something. Yeah, which I don't think was directed by a woman. I, I, I don't up. even know. I just, just given how they shoot Halle Berry in that movie, I'm really guessing yeah. that's, who knows. But yeah, no, Wonder Woman's really good. You can read my review. You can also read my piece. I'm just going to plug this right now. The Leftovers, which y'all know is one of my favorite series of the last few years, ended on Sunday night. And it was a great finale. I had a lot of thoughts about it. And I wrote, it's like a 4,000-word essay because it was kind of about the life of the series and the ending. And I really like that piece. It goes deep. It, it spends a lot of time on, I think, personal reflections, which if you read any piece anyone's writing about The Leftovers right now, I'm not alone in that. It's a right. show that I think inspires very personal reflections on things. So um, you can go ahead and read that too. And if it makes you uncomfortable, I understand. <laughs> so that's how it is. But on today's show, we're not going to go into depth on those things because Sean hasn't seen them, and that would be unfair if I revealed how the end of the Wonder Woman movie is her killing the entire Suicide Squad. Oh, man, that would be great. I mean, I didn't even see Suicide Squad. That would be great. Yeah. No, but uh, we're going to talk about the new Doctor Who. Yes. We're going to talk about episode five of Twin Peaks. We finally have more Twin Peaks to talk about. Yeah. Uh, quick reactions to both of those, Sean. Uh, Doctor Who was okay. Is the weakest episode of the season, I think, so far. Yeah. Like, I like I kind of enjoyed the episode in spite of itself in a lot of ways, but I don't think it's like a train wreck of an episode. No. And then Twin Peaks continues to be amazing, and also I have no idea how we're going to talk about it because it's like it just 
melts into your subconscious in a way that I don't know any other TV show ever has. Here's how we're doing it. I've been taking notes scene by okay. scene, so I know what to talk about. That's good. That's that's. I realized that about five minutes into the episode, rewound the episode, got my laptop out, and I'm like, I'm writing about this. Yeah, because so. I just like, I feel like I got five minutes into Twin Peaks, and then I just like fell into a dream state. Yeah. And then the credits started rolling. I'm like, oh, what did I just do for the past hour? Holy shit. It's the best. Uh, we're also going to do a little bit of news. We're going to preview E3, which starts next week. And we will, of course, do our E3 coverage. Yeah, I'm, I'm already, you know, preparing to kill myself over watching every fucking E3 press conference for reasons I still don't really understand. And, uh, yeah, that's one of our signature episodes. So we're not going to let that down for you guys. We no. do it every year. Um but yeah, uh, the podcast is coming out on Wednesday this week. Wednesday might be the default day going forward for at least a little while because we've added Twin Peaks to the lineup and it's yeah. fun to talk about. That airs during when we used to record the podcast. We usually yeah. recorded Sunday nights, so that wouldn't work unless we got to every episode a full week late, which I think would be or weird. Or we just, like, in the middle of recording the episode, just be like, oh shit, Twin Peaks is on, and turn on Twin Peaks while we're recording, and then just live commentary over Twin Peaks, and therefore make every single podcast four hours long, at least. Uh, people would probably enjoy that at least for an episode or two. For, I think they would maybe tolerate one episode, and then okay. just like, just stop it, just stop yeah. it, you jackasses. All right. Uh, but we're going to talk about all that first though a couple pieces of stuff um sean speaking yes. of david lynch yes speaking of twin peaks and, and his works i have been going through sort of the pieces of his catalog that are still new to me a couple of films i hadn't seen one of those one of the last ones on the list for me was dune yeah his infamous 1984 film yeah that uh yeah that leaves a mark on film history it's, yes it does and so I finally watched Dune. I had the, I'd had the Blu-ray for like a year and I hadn't got around to watching it. But I finally put it in and watched it. First off, I'm amazed that that movie has one of the better catalog transfers from the 80s that I have seen on Blu-ray. Like it looks kind of immaculate for a movie of that era. Yeah. And it's amazing that a, you know, a movie that famously bombed, is famously, has a mixed reception, let's say, got that much love and care on Blu-ray. <laughs> it's amazing to me. Uh, that is... By far the most incoherent David Lynch movie. Yep. And I am including Inland Empire in that. Yes. And it is important to note that you have not read the book. No. So, because I have always said in regards to the Dune movie, it is an incredibly fun movie to watch. But you should only watch it if you have read the book. Because that movie is probably the worst adaptation of a book I've ever seen. At least in terms of communicating the plot and characters of the book to the screen. I think there's something about like the tone and style of the movie I think is awesome in yes. grabbing those. Dune is a very strange, unusual science fiction franchise, and it's got a very bizarre universe and, and sort of setting to it. But, man, does that movie just not even give a shit about trying to like relate the plot of that book to you. No. And, see, here's the thing. I had heard you say this many times, mm -hmm. and it frankly made me more curious to watch the movie without reading the book. Because it just felt like, on some level, David Lynch would love for people to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. Just, just how weird it is. No. But, like, and here's the weirdest thing about that movie. If you read the Wikipedia plot summary of, like, the film, yeah. and then you read the Wikipedia plot summary of the book, they're almost identical. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's not it that hits. he adds or, like, adds things that are, like, totally new and, like, makes up subplots. Yeah. He just, like... He goes through it at lightning speed. He goes through it at lightning speed and kind of cuts out the whole middle part of the book where, like, it's not necessarily super important for plot development, but that's where all the character development happens is in the middle of the book. It just kind of, like... The romance happens over all of it. The romance happens in a dream, yeah. And then when they meet in reality, it's just a given that they're gonna fuck. Yeah, like that. In the yeah, the romance is one of like the most major plot lines in the whole book. So of course it is. No, that movie is immensely strange. It and if you read like the history of it, you know he basically had like a four hour cut, and it's like you can't release a four hour cut of Dune, and to get it down to the length that was released at, which is like two hours ten minutes. Not only did they have to cut every scene to ribbons, they then did this super weird thing in the movie where characters are constantly giving voiceover. Yes. And you can tell, like, they're on the ADR stage, like, looking for mo pockets of silence and being like, okay, quick, 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 do the line, and then, like, end the line as soon as you can because, you know, Kyle MacLachlan is about to start talking again. And so it's all these, like, just in between where you would have silences, characters are saying in the most ethereal voice possible... Like, their, their, their inner thoughts. Yeah. I mean, it's the... the One of the best parts of the movie is that, like, 
for whatever reason, all the narration is done in this whisper. Yes. So it's like from, and it's something that I just love the lines in like the delivery of some of the lines in the movie that I have not seen this movie since I was like in high school. And I still remember stuff like Kyle McLaughlin going, Muadib, my name is a killing word. It's like, <laughs> why were, why are you narrating it like that? What the, f- what, it, what is that direction? It kind of feels like someone trying to do an action movie a la Terrence Malick. Right. I'd like where Terrence Malick narration is kind of like that, but it's also over long, wistful scenes of like fields of wheat and stuff, and it works in that very calm setting. But here it's like, yeah, there'll be a heightened scene, and then you'll look at Kyle McLaughlin's face and he'll whisper something that makes absolutely no sense if you don't know the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because that's the thing also. The narration is there supposedly to clarify things, and it largely doesn't. No. <laughs> I don't know if there is a way to clarify what's going on in that film. Like, things just happen. Like, not with real setup, not with real payoff. Things just happen, and by the end of the movie, everyone is holding out these weird little, like, laser guns and shouting words of power on elephants and, like, yeah. ta- or no, on giant, like, sandworms. And Sting is prancing around going, I will kill him! Yep. Yeah, that's that's one of the weirdest things is at the end. Apparently, I guess the scene is in the book too, but like they're like, all right, scene hasn't had any or Sting hasn't had any big scenes in this movie yet. A uh, knife fight with Kyle McLaughlin. I mean, I don't know what you mean. He has the biggest scene in the movie when he walks out oiled up in like a weird thong. That's that's, that's true. that is the biggest scene in that whole movie for me, man. But I mean, <laughs> it's funny. I don't. I can't call it a bad movie. No. I can't call it a good movie. I agree with you, though, Sean. It is an amazing movie. Right. I'm so happy you know exactly what I mean. Yeah, no. like It's a movie it's impossible to recommend to people because there's no way you could like really qualify it as good. But it's so much fun to watch because of just how fucking bonkers it is. It is. And, you know, I'm not even sure if it's one of those movies that, like, as a David Lynch fan, you, like, need to see because it helps you understand his career. It really doesn't. No. It's, it's different than anything he's done. But it is fascinating to see a guy like Lynch who has a pretty irrepressible voice it's still there even in the most you know studio thing he's ever done yeah. you just can't get rid of it and putting that you know it feels like in a different world where he could do something more open with the material that actually does seem like a fairly good match of director and material oh, i think so for sure like i said dune is one of the most bizarre sci-fi novels i've ever read like it's yeah. the, everything with like how the spice works and their weird like interspace travel like all that shit it's so just strange like if you're someone that's very used to star trek style sci-fi universes or star wars style sci-fi universes dune is in this whole like weird other realm that it's not hard sci-fi it's not like sci-fi fantasy it's like i don't know what the fuck dune is it's beautiful yeah and i like went and read the wikipedia summaries of that and the other books just to get a sense of like where does this story go and it is so bizarre like there's points where they do like ten thousand years of space history and stuff but yeah it's like I, I watched the movie, and there are definitely mo- like sustained sequences in that film, though, where I feel like Lynch and the material breathe together in tandem, and it's startlingly like beautiful and interesting. And there are moments where I think they clash uncomfortably, and there are moments where it's all cut to ribbons, but it's all interesting. Like, it is yeah. a... It's consistently fascinating film to watch. Yeah. It's also just got, like, great set design. Oh, my and, God, and yeah. set. Like, I just love the look of the movie. The, like, when the sandworms pop up and stuff. That stuff, it captures something about that to me. That is, again, like, it's not a good movie, but there's something about it that I find so attractive that, that I really do yeah. love it. And it does make you long for, like, if Lynch could have done... Like, kind of the unhinged version of it. Whatever that would have been. If it had to be released as, like, three 90-minute movies or something. Like, I would kind of love to see that. Because there is so much that works. Like, I don't think there's another actor in all of time and space who could play Paul Atreides better than Kyle MacLachlan. No. He has a very particular quality for that very strange character. Again, I haven't read the book, but I just, I get the feeling. Because it is about this guy who kind of starts life as a blank yeah. And winds up becoming this mystical space messiah. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why his name is Paul. You know, yeah. it's like the most kind of like bland, normal, like everyday human, like like English earth person word, like or name for someone is just Paul. And then, yeah, over the course of the story, he's, you know, becomes, he joins the Fremen, like the Sand People yeah. on Dune and all this shit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's a different character in like every 30 minutes of that movie. Uh-huh. And, and yeah, Kyle McLaughlin, like you can so tell what the moments are where he and Lynch just, I think, 
locked energies together. And that is that relationship continues to this day. I mean, yeah. if for no other reason, Dune is important because if it weren't for Dune, we wouldn't have Blue Velvet, we wouldn't have Twin Peaks, we wouldn't have New Twin Peaks because none of that exists without Kyle MacLachlan. Yeah. So that's amazing to me. And yeah, that's a fucking movie. That is a fucking movie. Yeah, I'm yeah. very glad you watched it. Now I you mean, have to read the book. Do you think the book's worth reading? Is it a good? Yes, okay. I, I really like. I I don't like the other books very much. I have only read the first two, and then kind of got partway through the third one, and gave up on it. Yeah. I think the first one is great, and like doesn't really need other books because okay. part of the magic of the book is how like sort of inexplicable a lot of the setting is, but not yeah. in a way that's like, oh, this is stupid. It doesn't make any sense. It's like it has that almost Lynchian kind of like dream state thing of like things kind of make sense when you glance at them and then when you examine them too closely it kind of like fades away it's got that quality to the setting that i love i've been on a reading kick lately so maybe i'll throw that in the pile yeah i went over to barnes and noble the other day looking for i forget what i was looking for they didn't have it but they wound up you know how barnes and noble publishes those classics yes that are like really good versions of all they had all of them on sale for five bucks a pop oh great so i got a bunch of those yeah, because there were a bunch of ones that I like. I might have had at some point in my childhood, like their Sherlock Holmes collections, but yeah. I have no idea where those are. So I'm like, I'll rebuy these. I love having these. So I've been like, I read Treasure Island again, which might be my favorite book ever. I've read that like six times now. And then I realized, like, I've never connected the dots that the Robert Louis Stevenson who wrote Treasure Island also did Jekyll and Hyde. Yes, yeah. I knew they were both Robert Louis Stevenson, but I just didn't make that connection, you know? Right. So I've been reading that. I actually read, like, the first half of that, because it's a novella. I yeah. the first half of that this morning. That is a fascinating book because we live 200 years after its publication and know that Jekyll and Hyde are the same person. Right. And the book so is about that twist. Uh-huh. It's really fascinating to me. But you were mentioning it last week because of the stupid Dark Universe yes. stuff. Well, I mean, are you really excited to see Russell Crowe take his expert hand to Dr. It Jekyll is, and Mr. Hyde? It is. There's no way anyone involved in the Universal new stuff has actually read the Robert Louis Stevenson book. No. Because it is... One, no way anyone would make a movie out of that today. It's two, it's the most low-key horror kind mm-hmm. of thing you can have. I don't even know if you would call that a horror novel novel, novel or whatever. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's just, it's like, yeah, we're going to take that and have Russell Crowe play Jekyll and have him be Nick Fury in this. I was like, no! That's just, fuck you guys. Yeah. <laughs> that has nothing to do with anyways. Um, your favorite book, Frankenstein, I got a yeah. copy of that. So I've, I'm trying to like go through basically this one era of like genre stuff yeah, for myself. Yeah, sort of like gothic horror, sort yeah. of Victorian gothic horror stuff. Grabbed a Dracula copy. There you go. That's and then I'll, maybe I'll jump 50 years ahead after all that and do Dune. There yeah. you go. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, it's all, it's just one lineage. It's the canon of like Western literature is Dune, Frankenstein, Dracula, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and everything else who needs it. Yeah. So that's, that's what I have always said. My professors didn't like me very much, but... Yeah, that's, that's why you were kicked out of school. Yeah, no. Yeah, you kept writing essays just about those three books, no matter what you were reading. Yeah. No, I'm not going to write about the Canterbury Tales. I'm writing about Dune. Shakespeare, fuck off. No, I'm going to write about fucking Frankenstein. Yeah. I may have actually said that once. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you have any stuff going on, Sean? Um, I've got a couple of stuff. Like, it, it, I, I watched a movie that I rewatched a movie. This is the third time I've seen it um, since the last time I recorded the podcast. And since you talked about Dune, I'll talk about um, Hadakiri, which I believe you've seen that as well, it's right? A it's great a, movie. Yeah, it's one of my favorite movies. It's from the early '60s, directed by Masaki Kobayashi, who also directed like the Human Condition trilogy and stuff. And it's and it's a really just brilliant. Um, samurai movie from that era and one of the reasons i kind of want to talk about it on this podcast is having rewatched it now after persona 5 i think there's actually like a lot of similarities between uh Harukiri and persona 5 where the basic yeah the basic sort of thing with Harukiri is it's about if, actually i don't want to like give the plot synopsis too much because the plot is really really fantastic but it's basically about this sort of the practice of Harukiri, which is ritual suicide for samurai in the feudal era of Japan and sort of the plot of the movie and sort of the theme of the movie is about how sort of the upper classes and the authority, the the shogunate and stuff like that in Japan at the time used those kinds of things like Harakiri to sort of oppress and control not just the samurai class but like the you know the working class and the poor and and it's about this very individualistic tale about this samurai sort of like trying to defy that authority and it's a very unusual kind of story and something that Kobayashi, as the director, is kind of unusual in a lot of the stories he tells in his movies, in that they are a lot about that 
very hyper individualistic like the individual against the system against the man which is something that not to say that there's not other japanese media that does that but it's very rare i think to find japanese media that is that pointed about it in a way that that's a much more common theme in like western and particularly american media of like the you know the glorifying the individual and going against the government or whatever and that's very much what Persona 5 is about. And I think the ways that Persona 5 is so uncompromising in how it goes after those themes is also like Hadakiri is like one of the most ruthless fucking uncompromising and, movies I've ever seen. And that's every Masuki Kobayashi yeah, movie. Like, yeah. that Persona 5 definitely, I think, if you were to make a Japanese cinema comparison, has a lot of Kobayashi in it. Yeah. It's, that's not just a movie I love. That's a movie I recommend to people all the time. Yes. Like, yeah. I, I my, like for instance, my brother was having to write a, f- a paper on uh, Japanese film scores, and he was this one composer that who, who composed all these movies, like, for all the directors. And I saw Harakiri on the list, and I said, that's the one you have to write about. Yeah. Just because yeah, it, really it gives you so much. And, yeah, it, it, it's such a great movie. It's the slowest of slow burns. Yeah. And it is a movie that feels its length. And yet you cannot look away. No, I mean, it's something that... One of the things I find most remarkable about the movie is it's one of... I think because of how intricate and precise the plotting of the movie is. Like, it is so tense. Like, even when I know the plot, like, front to back now, because it's the third time I've seen the movie in, like, probably, like, three or four years at this point. I mean, I think I've basically seen it once a year since the first time I saw it. So I know the plot really well, but it still just grabs you so much and you get really drawn into it. But also the movie... Like, 80 to 85% of that movie is shots of people sitting and standing perfectly still. For, like, yep. the whole movie. Which is, like, you know, the part, part of that is a stylistic thing of the era that it was definitely more common in, I mean, older movies in general, but especially Japanese movies, older Japanese movies than it is, like, modern, current, like, Hollywood cinema. But even then, for, like, movies of that era, it's still just, like, man, every fucking shot. It's everyone is just sitting or standing still. But you're still just, like, drawn in by the movement of the camera. And then in the scenes where characters do move, especially when it gets to the sort of the action climax at the end, it's like, it really stands out to you. And it's one of those things of it's a really subtle touch, but does so much to sort of conflate with the themes of the movie of how the Japanese sort of government and the Japanese culture it sort of represses and forces these people to like sit 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 and then finally it's like no I'm not fucking sitting anymore and it's a really it's a really powerful movie I love it a lot beautiful black and white white cinematography absolutely yeah nobody did black and white better than the Japanese yeah. and especially in that late era where color was around but a lot of the Japanese directors either you know couldn't afford it or did just didn't want to use it and and they kept going with it and made incredible movies like Harakiri yeah. with it. Um, also, that movie stars the great Tatsuya Nakadai. Yes. Who's who, like 30 years old in that movie and plays like a 60-year-old man. And it's, it's perfect. I, I think if... I think Tatsuya Nakadai is as good an actor as Toshiro Mifune. Oh, absolutely. But where Toshiro Mifune is a fucking movie star yeah. in that when he is on screen, you know it's him. Nakadai is the most chameleonic actor I think I've ever seen in that he he frequently plays like super old characters or characters in heavy makeup or something and does not draw attention to himself even when he is the main character. And so you often have to like... Like man, this actor is doing an amazing job, and then seeing the credits, like it was him again. Yeah, it's like John oh, Nakadai, you got me once more. Because he's in everything. Yeah, he's he the, is in everything. He, he's the guy in um, uh, um, God, the second um, uh, Sanjiro. Sanjiro, yeah, yeah, who gets cut in half at the end. Yeah, and again, you don't really notice it's him because that's the one movie where he's not in heavy makeup. Yeah, he also plays the Emperor in Ron, where he also mm-hmm. looks like ninety years old. He yeah. just he did that all the time. And he is also, if you see an interview with him now, and I think there's one on the Criterion disc there for Harakiri, yeah. um, he, he, he looks better as an old man than any of the makeup made him look. <laughs> it's kind of funny. He's yeah. aged pretty well. But yeah. Um, I'm glad we got to talk about that movie for a couple minutes. Yeah. It's, it's no. an awesome fucking movie. One other thing I did is I haven't played a lot of it, but I, sort of, but I want to talk about it a little bit, is I, I jumped into the Gwent beta so this is it's this time of the year where we, we talk about video game betas and stuff all the time. <laughs> Welcome down to my beta corner where we get to talk about the Gwent beta. It's Sean's beta corner. Yes. Thank you very much for the jingle. So this is Gwent the Witcher card game, which is something I've been sort of pretty excited about. And I wish I had more time to sort of dump into it, but I just haven't had a lot recently. But I think it's, it's a really interesting game in how they've taken... What is a really simplistic card game at its core from The Witcher 3, which for those who don't know, Gwent was 
a small mini game in The Witcher 3 that, you know, is a sort of interesting kind of mix of, I would say, like, poker and Magic the Gathering in a weird way, of that a lot of the game was about you sort of bluffing the player and trying to make it so that you would be able to win a round without expending as much of your cards as you needed to by kind of trying to force the... um the other player to effectively fold it kind of has a more or less poker mechanics but then also you are collecting cards and some of the cards have like special abilities and stuff obviously in a way that a poker type game would not have and so that was always really fun because the games were really fast paced and you kind of like moved through them and and had that like fun back and forth with the ai of sort of learning how to kind of force the ai to do what you wanted it to do so you could win in the witcher 3 and so now kind of i'm probably looking at the success of a game like hearthstone uh, CD Projekt Red have made a sort of more, f- more fully featured version of Gwent and put it out as its own game, and you can play the beta right now for free on PlayStation 4, PC, or Xbox One. And it's really interesting. I've only kind of played the tutorials and done a couple of practice matches so far, but they have definitely fleshed out the game a lot more. There are a lot more different kinds of cards that have a lot more different abilities, and it's something that's been kind of fun just going through and just sort of relearning how to play this game when it is much more kind of now leaning on the Magic the Gathering side of things and not quite as much on the poker. And I kind of wish that it maybe, and maybe like once I get deeper into it, it will, I will like find that balance again. But right now having to learn all these other mechanics on top of it makes it feel like it's maybe drifting a little bit too close to the more traditional collectible card game thing. Whereas part of the charm, I think, of the original Gwent was this like having to realize like, right, this is not a game where you like draw a card at the beginning of every single turn that than the way you do in any other like CCG. This is like you draw your hand and that's your hand and you have to just do what you have with that hand and win the game in the way you do in like five card draw poker like Texas Hold'em or something. And I think they there are a lot more like card draw mechanics in the game that you can do that give it a bit more of that magic feel. But it's still really fun. It's it's cool to see all those like the card art like kind of redrawn in this much like more high res like you can definitely tell they took a lot of time being like let's make all the cards look really cool and put some cool animations in playing the cards and doing all like the opening card packs and all that stuff it's fun nice yeah i've i've had that downloaded on my xbox forever but i've never played it Mm -hmm. i don't know Um, because you never really got into gwent on witcher 3 proper did you no like i thought it was cool i felt like there's so much going on in the witcher that was like the one thing i didn't dive into in that game but i respect it i thought it was neat yeah i thought it had a fun there's something about being able to just say like i'm gonna like stop all the questing and like walk into this tavern and school some fools and gwent <laughs> and there's something especially definitely about that poker-esque element to it that felt like there was a weird believability to it in the witcher 3 of like other than, obviously, it was kind of weird that, you know, there's, like, a Geralt card in Gwent and stuff like that. That, obviously, that does not make sense within the universe or whatever. But there's a certain believability to, yeah, like, this is more or less the kind of card game I could see, like, this, like, surly dwarf and Geralt <laughs> the Witcher and, like, this prostitute, like, all playing together. It's just, like, it's got that kind of feel to it, and I really like that. There, there has been a lot of Witcher going on in my house uh, at the moment because my brother is, is home from college, and he, uh, because he obsessively replays video games, he's playing The Witcher 3 again. And, uh, actually, you know, he has, like, a super nice PC, yeah. so he's running that game at, like, 4K, 60 FPS and all this. I actually think there's something about that game that at, like, that high resolution and frame rate weirds me out a little bit when I watch him playing it. Because I think that's actually the kind of game that works so totally fine at 30. Right. And, like, I don't know, there's just, there's something about, like, the slower pace of it. That when I see that, I'm like, oh, oh, God. Like, I'm sure I'd get used to it. And, and yeah, it's just... like the first time you you went and, like, watched The Hobbit in 48 frames per second and had to watch, like, the first five minutes. You're like, right, okay, no, this is, like, my brain is just messing with me. Nobody is moving super fast. Like, that's yeah. not how this is going. But, it, like, you know, it definitely does things of, like, at that, like, facial textures that I thought looked amazing on PS4 just aren't made for that, you know, when right. you push them up that high, you know. So, but anyway, uh, The Witcher's a good game. Witcher's a great game. Yeah, I still yeah. need to play the DLCs. Yeah, oh, yeah, man, they're real good. Yeah. Uh, speaking of video games. Yeah. I played a couple. I want to talk really quickly about Fire Emblem Echoes one last time, because I was almost done with it when we did a chat on it last time. But I did finish it in the last... I actually finished it like the day after we talked about it last. How and many small children did you have to murder to finish that game? <laughs> um, none near the end. I actually made it through relatively unscathed from the final battle. I did let a p- couple of units die uh, really noble deaths in the final battle. Like one character you get named Valbar, who his whole story is he's like this great knight who had kind of retired. 
And on his when he got home from like his campaigns, his family had been murdered by the bad guys in this in this game, and so he has like no family, and he decides to join you to kind of fight because that's his only purpose in life. Yet he's a pretty cheery guy through all of this. But I did like I needed someone to kind of sacrifice themselves, and I thought you know I think that's a good ending to Valbar's story that he goes to be with his family, knowing he's helped save the kingdom. I'm I'm sure he's really grateful. You're like yeah, I think this would be a good ending to your story is to you just go die it's like. I mean, I would prefer if the ending to my story was, like, I got to live and live happily ever, like, hang out with you guys or something after this. is like, I think that would be a pretty fun, and I like, I, I like happy endings personally, but okay. I also let the old wizard die, whatever his name was. Yeah, fuck him. Because he was, you know, he's pretty old, so I thought, not a huge loss. I mean, it's a good ending to his story, too. <laughs> yeah, totally. No, but um, the ending of Fire Emblem Echoes is fantastic, and there's a specific thing in the storytelling I wanted to talk about. And maybe minor spoilers, but I don't care. And, okay. and you don't have a 3DS, so you're not going to play yeah. it right now, or anytime soon. Um, Fire Emblem Echoes, like most Fire Emblem games, like most JRPGs, like, let's face it, most Japanese video games, right. ends with you having to fight and kill a god. Yes. That's just, that is the most Japanese trope in video games, right? Yeah. Yeah. You fight and kill gods. And... Fire Emblem Echoes does it as well as I have ever seen it done. And, like, between this and Persona 5, we've got, we're having a good year for Japanese games where you kill a god at the end. Very specific, but yes, it is yes. a good year for that. <laughs> but not for Japanese games. That is a common trope. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, like, um, how they do it is so... Because they see it throughout the entire story. Because the entire setup for Fire Emblem Echoes and this kingdom, or this divided continent of Valentia is that it was created by these two sibling gods Mila and Duma and Mila and Duma were like sibling dragon gods like in the before time and they had this rivalry that led them to create this continent and then kind of split it into two areas because Mila was this god who believed that humans should uh, be able to just live in complete peace and they should have complete harmony and they should have all provided for them by the earth and that they shouldn't have to do any work whereas Duma thought force was everything and like humans should be strong and they should make powerful armies and all this stuff and so they wind up coming into conflict and making these two very different empires the Regalian Empire which follows Duma and is all about force and the kingdom of Zofia which is the Mila Empire and is much richer and more bountiful because Mila makes the earth grow and all this stuff and that's kind of so the kingdoms kind of hate each other and are in perpetual conflict and you play as these two characters Alm and Selica who have connections to the various kingdoms but are childhood friends and it's kind of about you know tying all this together but at the end of the game it gets really thematically interesting where if you look at like that setup and kind of how they start to go with it, you realize like this is a very unhealthy version of like a God creation story because both Duma and Mila are giving to their people a really bad worldview, like a very right. incomplete worldview, but people are relying on those gods so much. And so like when the game picks up, Mila has been missing for a little while and Zofia, the Zofians don't know what to do. Like they don't know how to live without everything being provided for them. Whereas Duma has like lived so long, he's got a sickness in his brain and all the Regalians are becoming more and more violent because of this. So there's, there's these interesting kind of things going on with the gods throughout the game. And the kind of final stretch of the game is about one of the gods is like has realized this and is going to die through like natural causes and, and wants the humans to be able to live for themselves. And the final thing is you have to kill the other god so that you can like let it die and let the world move on because these gods have lived literally too long and held back human progress. And the entire end of the game thematically is about getting rid of that and resetting the status quo and trying to live in a world like where humans have to live for themselves and make their own choices. It's incredibly fascinating to me that I think it engages with those ideas so much more than I think the traditional JRPG probably gets into it. Right. Like I think Persona 4 is probably a good example of that, of a very smart game that still stumbles when it comes to let's kill a god because yeah. I don't think the characters really have to fully think about the implications of their actions in those final scenes. Whereas in Fire Emblem Echoes, it's very much about, we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we have to set like a clean status quo and we have to start over. And it's just, it's got a very interesting ending because of that, a very open ending. It's got a phenomenal final line from the narrator where it's ostensibly a happy ending, but he like reminds us that, you know, until the day when war would inevitably come again, as it always does for mankind or something like that. And it's like, right. yeah, like you're setting, because Fire Emblem always has this kind of historical storytelling where you're at one point in history, but you know history will continue 
like even if it's a thousand years later. Right. So yeah, it's it's really just a very well told story in the kind of that macro lens I'm talking about. And then all the things that happen with the characters throughout all of this, the presentation near the end of the game just goes to another level, like the music and stuff. It is and the voice acting which I've talked about. It's a really outstanding game, and I was kind of impressed by what a high gear the story kicked into. It was good consistently throughout, but I think found yet another gear of depth near the end. And yeah, I don't. I, I still it's probably too early to say where I would rank this among Fire Emblem games, but I definitely had a feeling coming out of it like that might be the most satisfied I've ever been playing a Fire Emblem game, and this is one of my favorite series. And yeah, so yeah. it's a tremendous game. Yeah, that plot sounds really interesting, like leaning into the creation myth aspect of it. Because that, like, what you described basically sounds like if you played, like, you know, a, like a sequel to that game that's set in the same universe, but it's like Fire Emblem, whatever, like a thousand years later, like the plot you just described was like the creation myth that that civilization would have about how the universe came to be and how humanity came to be. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like, it's an interesting, I, like, almost like a long form version of the Garden of Eden story. Sure, But yeah. where, like, God really just wanted everyone to stay there and shut up, yeah. you know, and never kicked anyone out or something like that. But yeah, it's it's really cool. And it, uh, that game also, like, clearly by the end, it is so much more than a remake. So obviously most of that writing is not in the Famicom game. Like, it does that game, I think, a bit of a disservice to just call it a remake because, you know, it does it. Again, it's like the first fully voiced Fire Emblem game and right. stuff like that. It's It's a really interesting experience. So... If you have a 3DS, you should play that. I would not necessarily recommend that one as your first Fire Emblem for reasons I've talked about before. I think Awakening or Fates is a much better starting point because that series can be very difficult. Yes. But, but um, if, you, if you've played at least one before, Echoes is one you should absolutely check out. Because behind Breath of the Wild and Persona 5, definitely my favorite game of the year. Cool. So I'm in that top three. Speaking of games that are difficult, yes. I also finished this week a game I have been trying to beat since I was a little kid. Okay. And that is the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2. Ah, Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels. Yes, as it is sometimes called. Yeah. Or, in the version I played, Super Mario Bros. for Super Players, because I was playing <laughs> the version on Super Mario Bros. Deluxe. Do you remember that? It's the Game Boy Color version. Okay, yes, yeah. And that's my favorite version of Mario Bros. Because it just it has a couple of little, like, the controls are a little better. It's got all these nice, like, extra modes and stuff. It's got a world map, and you can save and things like that. It's a great version of that game. Um, I have more affection for the original NES Mario Bros. than I think most people of my age, because it was one of the first games I ever played. The Game Boy Color was my first system I ever owned. That was one of the first cartridges I got for it, was Mario Bros. Deluxe. And I played that obsessively as a kid. So, I like, I know NES Mario Bros. like the back of my hand. Like, right. I can... Play. I, that's like the one NES game I could probably sit down and actually beat on an NES cart, you know, which I think most games I absolutely could not. Right, yeah. <laughs> because that would be really tough, but I could do that on Mario Bros. But, and Mario Bros. Deluxe has as an unlockable Mario Bros. 2, The Lost Levels. They call it Super Mario Bros. for Super Players, which I think is a fun title for that game. And I actually found my old Game Boy Color cartridge of it last week, and I looked, and the furthest I think I ever got into it was, like, World 5. But that game is infamously tough, and I could never beat it as a kid. And so I finally was like, you know, I've got it on my 3DS. I have save states. I think I could... I want to see this whole game. And so I wound up... I played, like, in one sitting through all of the original Mario Bros. and had a good time with that. Still, I think, one of the greatest games ever made. And then I went into the Lost Levels, and I finally beat it today... I felt proud because it's just like, and I did have to use some save states and parts, but it's like, sure. I've finally seen that whole fucking game. That is the worst Mario game. <laughs> yeah, I, I've only ever like kind of gone through, I think, World 2 is about as far as I made. I was like, I have a good idea of what this game is. I'm going to stop playing it now. It is ludicrously difficult. Like, in modern terms, how I would describe it is it feels like a series of pretty bad Mario Maker levels. Of like some douchebag on their Wii U being like, you could normally just jump to this platform, but what if I put it like three units further and maybe you have to jump completely blind and still you're probably going to miss it? Or what if I had levels where, like there's a level in World 7, I think it is, where the entire world is you have to hit these, those like trampoline blocks and send you up into the sky and then come back down and hit them and those are notoriously finicky. On the, in the original NES game, and that's the whole level, is getting through that. I definitely had to use save states on that. It is very hard, but not in a way I find the most rewarding Mario games hard. Like, Mario 3 on NES is a tremendously difficult game, 
but never in a way that feels unfair or frustrating. Like, it's right. just, it's a really good game. Yeah. And a lot of Mario games are like that. This one is just like, man, it, it really feels like Miyamoto and company just kind of shit it out in a weekend or something and went crazy. Like, that is a sadistic game. Like, the thing that always stands out to me in that game is the first level, which is hard enough, has two things right away. Where there is a hidden mushroom that is effectively impossible to get because it's in this little sky series of blocks and there's a Koopa in there. And one, to just make that jump in there is incredibly tough. But once you get in there, even if you get the mushroom, you're probably going to hit the Koopa and lose it. So it's worthless to go after it. And then the second mushroom you find in a normal block is the poison mushroom that kills you because Miyamoto was feeling I don't know he was in a bad mood when he made that game and there's like there are levels near the end where there are just poison mushrooms everywhere and there's stuff like cheap cheeps flying around and the little squid blooper things flying around in a non-water level because fuck it like that game it's I don't think it's a good Mario game I think it's a really actually pretty mediocre one and sometimes it's just frustrating for the sake of frustrating but it is kind of fascinating to play and it's like, yeah, there is absolutely a reason they released a different game as Mario 2 here. And American Mario 2 is better than Japanese Mario 2. Yeah. Like, I think there's something really interesting, though, about the idea of, like, what a video game sequel is. And, like, what, like, the Super Mario Brothers 2 represents within that idea is, like, instead of it being the way most video game sequels are, where it's like, okay, we're going to take a lot of, like, the foundational elements of this other game and build off it like a Super Mario Bros. 3. We're going to add more power-ups. We're going to put in the world map. We're going to do that stuff and, like, add in these other mechanics. And then that's what our sequels are going to be. Or it's like, oh, we're going to have, like, add some new stuff to the game mechanics, but it's mostly, like, you know, like, Uncharted 2 to 3 or something, where it's like, it's mostly that it's a big new story and new maps and all that kind of stuff. Whereas Super Mario Bros. 2, the philosophy used there is, like, we, we take the difficulty curve of the original Super Mario Brothers and we just make a new game that has like a couple of new things like the Poison Mushroom, but nothing sort of extreme, and just keep the difficulty curve ramping up until it's basically like completely vertical. Yeah. And that's basically what that game is. Like that was their like idea of we're just going to go from like whatever what the Super Mario Brothers one goes to like world eight or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's goes like this is like that's world eight. This is basically world nine of Super Mario Brothers, and that's how hard it's going to be, and just keep to- on going from there. Today we would call that DLC. Like, exactly. We would, yeah. it, it's an expansion pack for Mario, not a full sequel. And even within that, it's not just that the difficulty rises. It's that I think their philosophy to level design in places gets really wonky. I think it's the, probably something where it's like to try to make the yes. game more difficult. At some point, the base Mario game does not support that high level of difficulty without it just being utter bullshit. Right. And, you know, there's something I love about the original Mario Bros. Kind of like how I love the original Final Fantasy in just sort of... It's utter simplicity in terms of its approach. Like, if you study, like, an original Mario Bros. level, it's pretty much always a flat plane you're running across. And if it has risers, it's usually stair steps or something. It's not that the world itself, like, goes up and down and has mountains. This kind of stuff you would see in Mario 3 and World and, and New Super Mario Bros. and stuff. Like, if you're building a course in Mario Maker with, like, the original Mario Bros. skin and you have, like, the land going up and down and stuff, to me it doesn't look right because that's not what those levels are built as. It's about you moving left to right and overcoming sort of smaller obstacles and how they do difficulty is kind of ramping up the number of them. But it's pretty creative in how it does that. In this one, like, they break that and, like, there are whole levels where there's almost no ground. And it's like, you're going to have to jump across three flying Koopas in a row to get to the other side. And it's just like... How would anyone beat this on the NES without saves and three lives? I want to know how that's possible. I found a warp zone in World 4. You know what it does? It brings you back to World 1. Yep. That's what that game does because they're assholes. Yep. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's it's a pretty amazing relic of early Nintendo that that people don't don't ever talk about. (laughs) Yeah, like it's not even like the Zelda 2 thing where Zelda 2 has problems but it also like was so ambitious and experimental yeah, it was a very experimental game for its time and, and very influential on yeah. a lot of designers so like if you look at that and i don't think anyone views that with loathing or anything no but like yeah mario 2 is kind of forgotten for a reason <laughs> it's it's kind of like how i think people think about castlevania 2 of just sure. like this is just like nope nope Didn't like work. like you, we tried this idea for like this is how a sequel to a video game can be nope we're going to go do back and do the other thing <laughs> yeah so anyway um yeah, just wanted to... Because, again, I, literally, I have been trying to beat that since I was probably seven years old. Well, congratulations, Jonathan. Yeah, so finally fucking did that. Let's go ahead and move on to some news. What's going on in the news, Jonathan? Um, a couple of pieces of Nintendo news. 
Um, what has Nintendo been up to? Are they making a Super Mario Brothers 2 2? Finally, yet. after all these years, the even lost their levels? Yes. Uh, this first one, actually, I saw on a Nintendo channel. It's not an exclusive Nintendo game, but y'all remember one of my favorite games of last year was I Am Setsuna by the Tokyo RPG Factory. Silly name for a company. Yeah. Wonderful name for a company. It's a great name for a company. But they made this beautiful, soulful, wonderful game in I Am Setsuna. And I was so excited the moment I finished that. Like, what is this team going to do next? And we got a trailer for it. Um, this game is going to be on the Switch, on the PS4, on the PC. And it's called Lost Sphere. But Sphere spelled S-P-H-E-A-R. I did have to spell it out on the timeline for myself here. And uh, you watch the trailer for that. It very much looks like I Am Setsuna in terms of it's probably running on the same engine and stuff. It's got a slightly different battle system. This one looks more inspired by like a Final Fantasy VI or one of the like um, an ATB kind of more traditional thing. Whereas um, I Am Setsuna had the Chrono Trigger battle system. But we didn't see enough of it to really determine exactly what they're doing with it. But what I got out of it is it looks fucking beautiful. It looks like it's got some cool writing. The music is absolutely gorgeous once again. I'm all on board. I can't wait to see what this team does. I think it's coming out early next year. But I just I saw that reveal trailer and I was like, hell yeah! If you have not played I Am Setsuna yet, you should. It's got still got my favorite soundtrack of any game last year. It's that piano score is so hauntingly gorgeous. And I just I'm glad that this team was able to turn around immediately and, and get to work on something else. And that unlike other uh, studios owned by Square Enix, they're being actively supported. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I just like to picture just like the Tokyo RPG Factory is like this old like Victorian style like smoke giant smokestack just belching flames in the middle of Tokyo. It's like oh the the Tokyo the RPG Factory just started up again. They're hard at work. You just hear like like fucking hammers banging on anvils and shit. Or alternatively, I like imagining the small German town in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, sure. and like it's this—it's what you think is like this horrible or old industrial factory, and then you get in, and it's absolutely crazy inside. Yeah, who knows? Well, yeah, no, that's just on the outside. It looks like that, but yeah. once you go inside, it's just like chocolate rivers and <laughs> and random battles and all this nonsense going on. Yep. Uh, anyway, that looks cool. I'm glad they put out, and it's like a nice like five minute announcement trailer that gives you like a sense of what's going on in the game. Cool. So I would recommend uh, watching that and just getting excited for that game. I, cer- I certainly am. Cool. Yeah. What else has Nintendo been up to? Well, Nintendo also did uh, some press announcements about their online services. Because they have a summer coming up that's going to have a lot of online games. They have yes. Splatoon 2, they have ARMS, and as we heard, we'll talk about this in more depth later, they're also going to have Pokémon Tournament Deluxe, which will also be an online fighting game. So all three of those are going to be over the summer, so they clearly have this focus on online multiplayer. Um, so they revealed more details about their online services. They will be annou- uh, releasing over the summer a beta version of the app that will form the backbone of their paid service later on. In, uh, that'll come out in 2018. Um, but that app will have the voice chat and everything in it that um, we're still waiting to see the exact details on. Yeah. They also showed an absolutely hilarious illustration of this thing Hori is going to be selling that is a Splatoon 2 voice chat splitter. Uh, I, I saw this misreported in some cases. You don't need it for voice chat on Splatoon no. 2. You need it if you want to listen to the game and do voice chat out of the same pair of headphones. Yeah, so if you want to have a head, wear a headset and do game chat with that, but also want to be able to hear the game audio, because obviously if you're wearing a headset, it would be muffled if it was coming from the TV... That's what you need to buy. Whereas, like, you know, on the Xbox One or the PlayStation 4, you just have, like, the jack on the controller that you plug into. And so this thing is basically... It's a pretty amazing contraption where, like, one end of it is just, like... It goes into the, I guess, the audio jack on the Nintendo Switch. Yes. Which is, like... I do, it might be, like, re- kind of hard to finagle with if you have it plugged into the dock in your TV. And then that goes into a, like, Y splitter, one of which goes into the audio jack on your phone, or it goes into the audio jack on the adapter that goes into your phone if you have a new iPhone. That's true. And then the other side plugs into the headset. So you have to have, like, your, like the thing going to the Nintendo Switch plugged into your phone that is, I guess, like, at your side running the app, and then you're wearing this big headset on your head, and that seems... Especially for a console that is supposed to be portable, it's just like this is not this. Don't buy this. You don't. You don't need this. That's just like I get you. It's, it would be nice to be able to have the game audio in the chat audio coming at the same time the way you could on the other consoles. It's not worth it for this. Yeah. No. Uh, so maybe at one point someone will come up with a better solution. Yeah. But that is not going to be it anyway. Uh, so we'll get some of that over the summer. But they also detailed more what the actual 
Nintendo Online service is going to be when it launches in early 2018. It'll be twenty dollars a year. Yeah. So nice and cheap. Yeah. That's a third of what PlayStation Plus or Xbox are right now. And they also clarified they've clearly rethought their plans for their online game content, where they were they were, they were going to have a service kind of like Games with Gold or PlayStation Plus, but instead of it being a couple games a month, it would be one old game a month that you could only play for that month yeah. was their initial press release. Now it's going to be kind of what we all wanted Nintendo to do at some point, which is a growing library of older games, and as long as you have a subscription, you can play them to your heart's content. Yeah, although they have not been, I feel like, very specific about what that is actually going to entail, because I feel like I did not get a good sense of reading their press release of, like, they do not say anywhere that, like, those games are going to be available on that service indefinitely. It's like, I think there's a lot of wiggle room in there for when and how, like, games come on and come off of that service. Sure, and the other missing piece here is we don't know how, if, why, what, it will yeah. link with virtual console. Exactly, yeah. Because they still have not announced virtual console plans. Hopefully they will at E3. They're crazy people if they don't. I, I don't think. think they are. I, th- I think okay. them putting this press release out now, I think, tells us that they're not going to talk about it at E3, but I don't know. <sighs> All right, well, anyway, yeah, because I think... It's probably not just going to be they're going to put the whole virtual console up and you'll have access to all of it. No. But, you know, best case scenario from what we heard is a nice growing library of games that you can kind of go back to. That sounds cool. Yeah. For 20 bucks a month plus the online stuff sounds like a you know nice little deal and everything. But, um, yeah, I mean, we're still a ways away from it. It'll be interesting to see over the summer once the app comes out how that all works. Yeah. I'm very curious about a lot of this. We do know a lot more now. And it does sound at least like... Some of the worst instincts have been avoided. Yeah. It's not $50 a month. It's not as draconian as the game thing sounded it was going to be. You know, some of those things. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, but there definitely are a lot of question marks in terms of how they're going to handle old games on there. Because, like, they specifically talked about it as, like, the Nintendo classic game selection, like, real name to be pending. And so they're, like, very clearly not trying to use the virtual console name, at least for what their online service stuff entails. Yeah, and... You know, I would love if they just, at least at E3, were like, we have NES and Super NES Virtual Console, and you can get three games for each of them, and just start getting that out there. But because, I mean, because, like, when they made the, the, the press release, they had, like, very specifically talked about Super Mario Brothers 3, Dr. Mario, and Balloon Fight, yeah. and more. And I thought it was, like, that's a weird, like, three games. To, like, this is, like, we're going to say, like, these three games, uh, which I assume that's... That has to be that. Those are going to be like the three that launch with their classic yes. game selection. But it's like, and they, it was like it was weirdly specific to put that. There's like, why did I put like you know featuring games like the Mario series and Zelda games? It's like no, it's it's Super Mario Brothers three, Doctor Mario, and Balloon Fight. And, and the reason they did that is because they're specifically focusing on how they're going to be adding online functionality yeah. to the games, and those are three games with prominent multiplayer features. So yeah, that's why they picked those three. Right, but. What's the online for Super Mario Brothers 3? You can play two-player where you swap back and forth. They've done that before. Well, it's, yeah, I'm but like, I just, good. like, who that's... would play that offline? I was like, here, we can swap back. Like, why not? We can just both play on, like, we can just both play our own copy of Super Mario Brothers 3 and talk about it online. I, <laughs> but, it's, but that's always been a part of the game, and when they released that, for instance, on 3DS, they also added that functionality. Okay. So that has been a game they have done that with before. Okay. Yeah. That, that like, just seems like a weird way to play that game. It's it's kind of fun, but yeah. Sure. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so that's Nintendo's online stuff. It's Nintendo. Yeah. Speaking of Nintendo, today, uh, June 6th is today, right? Yeah. Yes. They had their Pokemon Direct, where they did some Pokemon news. And some interesting pieces of news, what was most notable was everyone thought there was going to be one particular announcement, and yeah. there wasn't. And I think at this point, we might just have to accept that Pokemon Stars might not be real. Yeah, like that has been one of the most prominent rumors about the Nintendo Switch for the longest time, to the point where I just assumed it was going to be true. Yeah, so so let's do a little recap here. Yeah. It had been reported, I believe, earlier this year that by a couple of outlets that Nintendo was working on something called Pokemon Stars, which would be a remake or a re-release of Sun and Moon, the most recent 3DS games, and they would come out to Switch later this year, and that would be like their Pokemon release for the year, and so it would be like almost like, you know, crystal to gold and silver, yeah. but it would be on the Switch, and it would be like a nice new HD version of Sun and Moon, and it would be like Pokemon's entry onto the Switch, and that sounded kind of neat, yeah. and it also sounded plausible. The fact that we still... Maybe it'll be an E3 announcement. That's... We don't know for sure it's not real. I, However, I would find be very surprised if it was at E3 when they have 
already done a pre E three Nintendo Direct specifically about Pokemon. Yes. I feel like you would announce all your Pokemon stuff there. I, I agree. So I'm just saying it's not completely like we can say definitively that's not real. Yeah. But what they did announce at the Pokemon Direct in that zone is they're releasing this November, November 17th, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, which are these sequel games to Sun and Moon, kind of like a Black 2, White 2 thing, right. which they did back on the DS. Kind of weirdly, X and Y never had a follow-up, even though they're, the well, Sun and Moon outsold those, but they were very they were the best-selling yeah. Pokemons up to that point for a while. Um, so yeah, Sun and Moon were a huge success. They're getting a sequel. This actually doesn't sound like they're going as far as they did with Black 2 and White 2. Yeah, I've had a hard time getting a sense of like what is actually going to be new in that version. Yeah, so what they've, it sounds like to me, it's, so Black 2 and White 2, I never played those, but I do know, you know, they basically were the same world, but with an all new story, some new Pokemon and stuff. It was like a proper sequel. Right. Um, whereas other ones like Emerald, Crystal, Yellow have been... Basically the same base game with some alterations and some additions. This is somewhere between those two extremes. It's more than just a couple alterations because they've said full on it's an alternate storyline. We don't know what that means. Yeah. But it doesn't sound like it's just the same story with enhancements. But I feel like you could... Oh, yeah. And you, with like marketing speak, I could totally say you could justify calling Pokemon Yellow or Pokemon Crystal alternate stories. Sure. Yeah, but who knows how they're selling that. And yeah. then, yeah, with new Pokemon and features, they haven't gone into it in depth. The trailer for it was very short. Yeah, so, you know, it'll probably do well and people might like it. It's a little weird that they're not just doing, like, a third version like Emerald or Crystal. Because yeah. that's what it sounds like this more or less is, maybe a more feature-rich version of that. But they're doing it for both Sun and Moon. Yeah. So, we'll see. We'll learn more on the way there. It's obviously... Those were a huge success, and I think Nintendo probably thought they would begin phasing out the 3DS this year, and instead Sun and Moon breathed new life into the 3DS. Sure, yeah. Well, not, not that they ever, the 3DS ever fell off, but it's like, that did well. They've had things like Echoes this year that did well. It's like, I think they're trying to like figure out how to keep the 3DS going, because that's not a train they want to pull the plug on too early. Yeah, but yeah, so that's what's coming in November. Yeah, they, and, and it's also important to note, like they made there was like a weird amount of commotion I thought on Twitter right after that, where it was like people trying to figure out is this thing like definitely only coming to the 3DS, and then later will be coming to the Switch, and then eventually Nintendo was like, no, like in like one of the most firm statements I've ever seen Nintendo give, they're like, no, this is coming to the 3DS, not to the Switch. It's like okay, yeah, they're aware of the stars. Yes, yeah. yeah. So again, it's still possible that there's a stars announcement and maybe it comes out the same time and they're complimentary releases that sounds unlikely to me yeah i my guess would be that they're just going to make a whole new pokemon game for the switch from yeah at some point and you know i've seen a lot of disappointment about this i think it's worth remembering pokemon never comes to the new console early yeah ever part of that is because of how well pokemon sells you don't want to sell, uh, cut pokemon off at its feet like pokemon on every system it's ever released on game boy to 3ds is either the highest selling title on that system or one of the highest selling titles on that system, and I think you and it it never would be if it's the if it's a launch window game if it's right. a year one game. So I think they just they're probably waiting to do a more proper game once the Switch has you know ten plus million units in the wild or something like that. Um, for, you know, from a business standpoint, the 3DS sequel frankly just makes more sense because yeah. they already have the assets made and everything. So you just do that. Um, so I wouldn't worry. That, that To me, this is not Nintendo saying we're never doing Pokemon on Switch. No, I think it's that's just way, you're going to have to wait a couple of years. Which we always have had to. Like yeah. Again, like Black 2 and White 2 I mentioned, the 3DS actually came out a month after Black and White 1. So mm -hmm. Black 2 and White 2 were like... It's like this scenario on steroids with how that happened. Like most people that I knew, like friends who switched from the DS to the 3DS, played the majority of black and white on the 3DS because it came out so close together. Right. Stuff like that. So, yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see. But, yeah, I would not... People, like, freaking out about this. Like, they're never going to bring Pokemon to Switch. They might never, but this is not an indication of that to yeah. me. All yeah. right. Speaking of the 3DS, they are also bringing... And I'm more excited about this one. Um, they're going to do a virtual console release of Gold and Silver, the Game yeah. Boy Color games. Last year, they did that with Red, Blue, and Yellow. Um, sounds like they did not announce Crystal. That makes me a little sad. Crystal's a really good version and it has a lot of nice... Like, that's where we first had Pokemon animations. Right. First had a girl character, all of that stuff. Crystal is awesome. But uh, they will at least have Gold and Silver. I saw the trailer and I was like, yeah, great. I can't wait to play, have those on my 3DS. Because, like, I played Crystal last year, emulated on my computer. But I always prefer to, like, have it on a game system. Yeah. And I just thought that would be fun. And then I'm like, this is coming out today, right? It's like September 22nd. 
fuck. <laughs> like, why? Why, yeah. They are adding, again, online functionality, so you can trade and battle with these on the 3DS wirelessly, and you can. it has all the Pokemon Bank functionality. So that probably is semi-complex for them sure, to build yeah. in. I guess I would just, I don't know, hold the announcement until you can do the cool card trick of like, and they're out today! But they didn't do that. We have to wait until September. Yeah. Oh, well, they'll release a cool gold and silver-themed 2DS for the kids. And, and then also, like, I guess we... I wonder if they're going to start doing, like, the Gen 4 remakes for Pokemon, right? Because they already did remakes for that one and then remakes for Ruby and Sapphire. Yes. So now... The next one would be Diamond and Pearl. Diamond and Pearl. I kind of doubt it, in part because Diamond and Pearl, nobody likes those games. Yeah, but, you know... Who knows? They're, like... I feel like they're just, like, on this whole weird thing with Pokemon where it's like, okay, we do the game, then we do the sequel, then we do the, the, the remake, and then now it's like, we do the... We re-release the old one, and now we're gonna do the remake, and then we do the new one, then we do the sequel to the new one, then we re-release the third gen ones, then we do the remake of gen 5. It's like, yeah. Jesus Christ. I think a lot of this is gonna depend on what happens with Pokemon on the Switch, because yeah. that remake cycle, I think, was facilitated by the continuity from... Game Boy to DS to, you know, 3DS and all that, and that there was some measure of backwards compatibility along the way through all of those, even if, you know, like, a 3DS can't play an original Game Boy game at this point, can play all the DS games. Um, Yeah, so, who knows? Like, I do feel like that cycle could just get disrupted because they're probably not going to make a remake the first one for the Switch. Yeah. But who knows? Yeah. Um, Yeah, we'll see. And it would be weird with Diamond and Pearl because that was a DS game, you know? So it wouldn't be as much of an adaptation either. Whereas, you know, for the first three generations, you were adapting it to the DS style, which alone kind of... Well, actually, Red and Blue were a Game Boy Advance remake. Yes. And a great Game Boy Advance remake. That's my favorite version of those games. But, like, yeah, it's a weird, weird scenario with Pokemon. And one last re-release. These are all basically re-releases. Yeah. Which is what's weird. Uh, Pokémon Tournament is coming to the Switch as Pokémon Tournament DX... And I'm sure it'll join in, you know, Mario Kart Deluxe and Smash Bros. Deluxe, which we'll probably hear about at E3 yeah. and some other things. Uh, because they have a lot of good Wii U games that no one played, so get them onto the Switch. Sounds fun. I mean, we just got a new Tekken game. Let's get Pokin in there, too. Absolutely. I can't wait till they make Tekken cross Pokin so a guy can watch, like, Gene Kazuma punch fucking Pikachu in the face or something. Yeah, I never got into Pokin on the Wii U, but, hey, who knows? Maybe they'll do a demo on the, on the Switch and I'll get to give it another shot. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was when I watched a video of Pokemon Tournament, I got really depressed because I only knew like two of the Pokemon. And I was like, "Ah, oh, Jesus! I've been away from Pokemon for so long that like yeah. their big Pokemon fighting game where you know they put all the most well-known Pokemon on." I'm like, I only really know two of those from games I've played, and then I recognized like another two kind of vaguely from marketing material, and the rest was like, there was like a Chandelier one or something. I was like, "What? <laughs> what is this? What has happened?" Yeah. So that was the Pokemon Direct. Uh, yeah, it, Pokemon continues to be a money train. Yes. All right. Uh, we're going to get into our pre-E3 stuff in a second here and talk about predictions, wants, desires, that yeah. kind of stuff. But I want to start that with, um, there was this interview that's been going around from Jim Ryan. He's the head of global sales for the PlayStation division at Sony. And he had a quote, he was talking about the kind of the future of PlayStation. And one of the quotes that's been grabbing people's attention was one on backwards compatibility, in part because at the top of probably everyone's E3 wish list for Sony year after year is, you're going to do something with backwards compatibility this year. Well, right? it's, it's you'll let us change our name on PSN, yes. and then it's backwards compatibility. The, in, in that order, yeah. I feel like it's what people care about for whatever reason. Yes, and uh, I think he pretty much shot that in the head for ever. With this yeah. quote, um, when we've dabbled with backwards compatibility, I can say it is one of those features that is much requested but not actually used much. That, and I was at a Gran Turismo event recently where they had PS1, PS2, PS3, and PS4 games, and the PS1 and PS2 games, they looked ancient. Like, why would anyone play this? I feel like there's two halves of that to dissect. Yes, there are two very different things being said there. Like, there's two one, halves of that sentence. One that is possibly defensible, yeah, and one that I think is kind of indefensible. Let's take the second one first. Okay, yeah. That's a stupid reason to bash backwards compatibility. Yes, it is. Um, One, you're referencing a racing game, which are not the kinds of games people are asking to play on backwards compatibility. Yeah. And yeah, games that are annualized and age extra fast are not really what anyone's asking for backwards compatibility for. And using that as a blanket statement to say, old games look old, lols, that's a really dismissive way to just dismiss a lot of the art of your medium. Yeah. And I don't like that. I don't like that attitude. And I think clearly you're mis- so misreading the pulse of gamers 
who are not wanting to play their old games because they look cutting edge, but because they're good games, and yeah. that does not really rely on graphical fluency. Yeah, and it is definitely like it is like Gran Turismo is such a just a strange example of like. Of course, the people aren't really going to want to go back and play Gran Turismo One on the PlayStation One like that. Like said, like because they're still fucking making Gran Turismo games, and there are obviously there are going to be people who play those games as kids, and it would be like want to go back and play it a little bit at least. Yeah. But it is like you said, it's generally for like the games that, especially games that were on PlayStation One, PlayStation Two that maybe like never came out again. Like maybe I don't know, like Persona Two Eternal Punishment on PlayStation One never like that PSP remake never got localized over here. Like, that's a, like, fucking awesome PS1-era JRPG that, if you want to play it in English, you have no other way to play it other than to play the PS1 version of that game. Backwards compatibility is a great way to go back and play that. I think that game holds up well. Yeah. Um, backwards compatibility is important. And I want yeah. to shift to the other half of this, where he says, you know, it's because it's a feature people want but then don't use. If I were reading between the lines on that, yeah, I would read that as... We're selling incredibly well, and we don't need to invest in that extra feature. Because that's what it is. It's, it's a nice extra quality of life feature. No, I don't think anyone is claiming backwards compatibility is like essential for the health of a system. Yeah. But I think if you look at the Xbox One, amidst all the struggles they're having, imagine how much more amplified those would seem if they didn't have the 360 backwards compatibility as this one thing I think people can rally around and say, hey, the Xbox One is doing really well in that area. And that is a reason that if like you were invested in a library of games from last generation, that might be a reason to pick that console. And I feel like that's one of the main reasons you do something like this is to try to stake out an identity, give your users more reasons to keep coming back, to stick with you. I mean... I just just look at like what Xbox has done with games with gold. I I'm canceling my PlayStation Plus. I'm not. It's up in a month. I have no reason to use it. I don't play games online on my PlayStation. I have not played a PlayStation Plus game in at least a year because they don't release good games. I, I looked at the games this month. The only one I'd even heard of was Life is Strange. That's yeah. one I might actually be interested in playing. It Life is Strange like, is very good. Okay. Yeah. But like that is a game worth playing. Sure. But like it, that's a that's a rarity these days is that they put out yeah. one of those. And Xbox has so geniusly gotten around that because they have two 360 titles every month and they tend to be pretty fucking good ones. And so they've really made Games with Gold feel like a really valuable part of that service, not just for the online stuff, but because, one, I think they've put a little more effort into choosing the actual Xbox One titles. They've had some good ones, but also like the backwards compatibility ones. That's a pretty cool thing. And it's just, it's something you can build into your suite of features that I think really helps your console distinguish itself and give your fans a reason to keep coming back. And to me, the reason why Sony has no interest in backwards compatibility right now is because they're a dominant market leader and they have no incentive to do it. Yeah, I mean, I basically agree. And it's something that I, obviously, I, I really would love a nice, big, comprehensive backwards compatibility thing for the PS4. But, like, from what I understand from, like, the data that does exist, I mean, he is right that, like, it is something that people almost, like, the vast, vast, vast majority of your user base never uses it. Like, regardless of even if you give them games for free on Games with Gold, from what I understand of the data I've seen, like, almost nobody uses the backwards compatibility features on the Xbox One at all to play Xbox 360 games. And so, yeah. like, it's something that's, like, I want to have it so bad, but, like, I also do understand the economic reality of I, it's not going to be this big boost for you. I guess. And, yeah. and But what's frustrating also is coming from... You know, I, the PS3 was not, like, the best backwards compatibility ever. In fact, it had pretty big problems and gaps. But the the PS1 Classics library they built up is impressive and good, and those run pretty well. And, uh, you know, they got those running on Vita as well. So yeah. it clearly it can be done on something other than PS3 hardware. They also, by the end of the PS3's lifespan, had a pretty good collection of PS2 games. It would be nice to at least have those there. I understand that PS3 games, for a number of reasons, would be harder to do. I would at least, like, the simple stuff, it would be nice to see. Sure, yeah. Especially this many years into the console's lifespan, you know, and, and where, you know, they're just kind of completely ceding that ground to Microsoft. I understand why in this moment it might seem like a good decision, it does seem like years down the road, if fortunes ever start to shift, I guess I'd rather have at least a little of that in my back pocket than none of it. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I, like, I think that about the Switch, too, with Virtual Console, that right. it's weird that's not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> you want to shore that kind of thing up. And Nintendo is different because I'm sure those numbers are not the same for Nintendo devices. Yeah. Because they have a pretty darn good back catalog. 
But yeah, it's uh, strange to me. Yeah, it's weird. Compati- like backwards compatibility is a strange, like really messy topic in video games because yeah. it is something that, like, especially for like something PS4 and PS3 is like, you know, even something like you know, like I don't understand a lot of the technicalities of it. But when you sort of hear the people who do it talk about it, you're like, yes, that sounds like that's really fucking hard to do. Yeah, but you know, again, it's just like I don't want to see Sony get too complacent sure, either yeah. with this stuff where they absolutely have on lockdown where it matters most in terms of the performance of the system and the number of exclusives they're doing great at that yeah but beyond that I don't think the PS4 has had that many significant innovations they haven't had to all I'm saying is that again you don't just want to kind of tread water for too long because you're not guaranteed to be dominant forever. And the more you kind of start using what you have to maybe invest in other ideas, and they kind of did that with PlayStation VR. I still can't kind of quite tell what that role that's playing in the larger PlayStation community. But, you know, it's, yeah. it's one of those lists of things I would like to see them do more with. So let's transition into talking about Sony at E3. Because okay. I actually think that's the easiest one to predict. Yeah. Because um, they're also, they are, other than Nintendo, they're the last one to go. Because Nintendo's a little bit weird because they just do their direct. But Yeah. yeah. Um, and they don't, they're not, like, showing off a game as centrally as they were last year with Breath of the Wild. Oh, I think, actually, I think Super Mario Odyssey is going to be there. I think that's basically what It is, but, like, do. they literally built an entire shit. Right. Like, that was their whole day was, yeah. I mean, I would not be surprised if that's basically what they're doing this year with Super Mario. No, sure. I'm sure yeah. we're going to see a lot of it. I just, it also sounds like they're not going to be that tunnel vision. Sure, sure. It. Yeah, but anyway, let's talk about Sony. Um, I'm guessing it'll be pretty much like last year's conference. I don't think we'll get any cool announcements like that because of compatibility. We'll probably no. see more on the pretty large number of games that literally have not been heard from since last E3, yeah. which is kind of funny when you put that together. And then we'll probably see some more games that won't be heard from for a while. And it'll look pretty cool. I'm not necessarily anticipating any big surprises. They've already got the PlayStation 4 Pro out there. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously we're going to hear like about Spider-Man. We're going to hear yeah. about God of War. We're going to hear about Days Gone. Like, the, like, I would not be actually surprised if Days Gone maybe came out like late this fall, yeah. maybe... Do you think it's possible that this could wind up just feeling like the sequel to last year's show because so Maybe. many of those games are going to have to be shown again? Yeah, I mean, it, but it's also like it's hard to tell because I think there's a really good chance we're going to see um, Sucker Punch's new game because we haven't heard anything from them yeah. since they did Second Son DLC. Because that was one of the big rumors for last year was that the Spider-Man game was going to be them, and but it ended up being Insomniac. Yeah. So that's a still a big question mark. They still have um, Ready at Dawn, which is the studio that made The Order 1886, the game that the world forgot. It's one of those, like, it's basically, The Order 1886 is like the Sony's um, Sunset Overdrive for that Microsoft has. It's like a game that, like, some people kind of liked it, a lot of people didn't like it so much, and it just kind of came out and then never one forgot it existed. And that game came out several years ago, so now I think, like, Ready at Dawn maybe has a thing to show. So I think there's a good chance we'll see a couple of new games. But yeah, I, I agree that it's mostly going to be more or less we expect. One thing I'm really ex- interested to see is if Death Stranding, the Kojima game, is going to be there in any, like, more real capacity. If, like, maybe we'll get, like, an idea of what that game's gameplay is going to be. Or, hopefully, this is just going to be continuing our theory of that that game is not actually a game and it is just an excuse for Kojima and his studio to make really elaborate, confusing CG trailers every single year and show them out of at E3. That's what I'm hoping to see from them. Yeah, I mean... At a certain point, if it is a game, yeah. they're going to have to stop making the trailers and actually make the game, which would mean they're going to have to skip some of these events, but who knows? I, I just feel like Kojima has so much fun making his trailers that I, I can't imagine him ever skipping E3 with the trailer. I know. He needs to put out, even if it's like a 50-second nothing trailer. And that's a PS4 exclusive, right? Um, yes, yeah, because Sony's invested in it. We're going to see something. Yeah. I'm pretty yeah. sure. There'll at least have to be some sort of mention of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any t- thoughts on the Sucker Punch game? Do you think it'll be another Infamous, or do you think they get to go the Horizon Zero Dawn route and do whatever they want? I'm going to, I'm definitely guessing it's a new IP. I would be pretty surprised if it was another Infamous game at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like if it was another Infamous game, we would have already heard about it by now. Okay. Like, I'm, yeah. Because, I mean, if you actually look at, like, some of the interviews that Guerrilla Studios did for um, Horizon Zero Dawn, like, they had been working on that game, like, around, like, a year before the PS3's life ended. Like, they started, like, pre-production on that game in, like, 2012. So it's yeah. like, new IPs take a long time to develop. So I'm, I'm guessing that... And there's a good chance that we actually won't see it at this E3 either. Sure, like, who knows? yeah. Um, yeah. We'll probably see more Last of Us 2. I actually would not be surprised if Last of Us 2 took an E3 off. Cause, okay. Just because I feel like they announced that so early. We're probably going to see, like, 
at least them have to they'll have to talk about that uncharted deal so that's i forgot that was coming yeah. out that'll that's be coming out really thing. soon yeah, yeah. So that, that'll definitely be there. I'm excited for that. I forgot yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited to see what that is. Like, after hearing that, like, it's just expanded into, like, in an a- Halo 3 ODST-like capacity has bloomed yeah. into its whole own game. That sounds interesting. Like, the thing I'm most curious about with Sony is what kind of presence PSVR is going to have there. Because I saw, like, earlier today that they have, like, surpassed over a million units sold through. So that's by far the most successful VR headset on the market. Even if, like, that's still not, like, you know, destroying the world and how popular yeah. it is. I'm curious. And, like, do we finally get a VR game that looks like an actual game? I mean, Resident Evil 7 was fully Forgot playable that. in VR. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And they just, that Farpoint game, which is, like, a first-person shooter, came out a couple of weeks ago on PSVR. Okay. Which was, like, the one they had been showing off kind of at every single demo of that back when it was called, like, The Morpheus they kept on showing off Farpoint, which is like a sci-fi first-person shooter, and that just came out. So now I feel like that was like the project that I always felt like, oh, that's what they're working on. That's going to come out. And now it feels like I have no idea what PSVR games are in development. So I feel like they need to show off something if they're actually going to be committed to that. I think last year was the first year that they completely 100% didn't even say the word Vita on stage. Yeah. Yeah. We are assuming that continues. Probably. Other than if, like, if there's, like, a good chance that there's some, like, like weird, like, third-party guy maybe up on stage, like, says it as a joke. It's like, hey, I was just backstage playing this remote play on my Vita. I sure do love that remote play. Like, I think there's a weird chance of that. But that's the only capacity in which we ever even hear the word Vita. Yeah. So, because the Vita's not dead. It's just... It's it's just it's you know it's if you want to play JRPGs and yeah. like visual novel stuff the Vita is a good console to have. Absolutely, I mean things still come out for the Vita, just not publicized. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. Um, then on Sony, like the other thing is um, that's definitely where we're going to see Destiny two because oh, Activision's yeah. they still have the marketing deal for that. And I would, I we could see Destiny two at every single show. Yeah, that's <laughs> there, there is a definite possibility of that. But they're absolutely going to have a big thing on yeah. at Sony's press conference. And the thing actually I'm most curious about with Sony other than the PSVR stuff, is what format the presentation itself is going to take. Because obviously last year was like the whole orchestra and like this hour-long sort of almost like movie-esque kind of presentation. And I'm curious to see if they go for that again or if they go for a more traditional press conference or maybe they just are like every single year we're going to do something new stylistically. So this time, like every uh, all our executives on stage have to like give their presentation in like interpretive dance. And I really want to see... I'm hoping that's what it is because I just want to see Andrew Whitehouse go up there and like do his dance and yeah, sort I'm, of have to figure out what's going on. I'm definitely assuming it'll be the same thing as last year. I, I just... They don't have anything big coming down the pipeline in yeah. terms of like where they would need a more traditional... You know, and that's because they're in a very healthy space. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's talk about some of these other ones. Um, I'm going to take Nintendo next because I think that one's actually pretty easy. Sure, yeah. I think the main focus will be Mario Odyssey. Yeah. Unless that game has been delayed, I just kind of doubt it. And again, Nintendo doesn't. When they say a launch thing like that concrete, like December of this year, they tend to be reliable on that. Not saying it can't be changed, yeah. but, you know, people make fun of, like, Zelda getting delayed. They never gave that, like, a hard launch window. So, yeah. Yeah, but anyway, um, so that'll probably be the main thing. I think we'll... I, I, I'm curious if there's going to be any other... Like, I'm trying to think of what game announcements we have yet to hear about. I do think if the Smash Bros. Deluxe thing is real, that's probably a good E3 announcement. Yeah, I would put it there. Um, I think... I'm trying to think of what other, like, big Switch things are rumored that we could be hearing about for the rest of the year, but I don't know. Do I you think, think we'll, the Switch Fire Emblem shows up? Does that have been announced? Um... Like, not Fire Emblem Warriors, you mean, but the... No, I mean, I yeah. would guess Fire Emblem Warriors is going to have, like, a trailer or something. But... Yeah, but the, the actual new one that's coming yeah. out next year. If they have anything ready to show, that would be interesting. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was literally, when they did that at the Fire Emblem Direct, it was, we're making it, yeah, but exactly. they didn't show a single thing. Yeah, so that would be interesting if they... I wouldn't be surprised, because if you haven't seen, Fire Emblem's gotten really big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, if Pokemon Stars is real, we'll see it here. If we don't see it here, I don't think it's real. No, yeah. I'm just going to say that. Um, I think we get another indie showcase because I think that's been an early highlight of the Switch. Yeah. And so I think we'll hear about that. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any like bold predictions of like a game we have no idea was coming and it'll be a big surprise. Metroid Prime 4, they're actually making it, guys. Well, okay. We still don't know what Retro Studios is working on. That has been... They're m- working on Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze 2 or whatever. Yeah. Like their third Donkey Kong game. I, I think it is possible we hear what Retro is working on. Yeah. And it is possible it's a Metroid thing. It's also possible. Let's all get, you know, not get our hopes up. 
probably it's not. Yeah, I, I'm not expecting a Metroid game announcement. If the People should not go in expecting a Metroid game announcement ever from Nintendo. Yeah. I don't think there's going to be anything too earth shattering from Nintendo. No. I, and I would love to eat my words on that. I would love a virtual console announcement. If we don't hear about virtual console here, I'm going to lose a lot of hope that we hear about it anytime in the near future. Yeah. Um, and it's just so weird that's not there yet, but whatever. Um, yeah, I, and I'm interested to see what other 3DS things they're going to have, because clearly they're not abandoning this. That new 2DS is coming out. Yeah. It feels like they've done a lot of 3DS presentations lately and have cleared the deck to mostly talk about Switch stuff. So, you know, I would, I would put a flag down, and I think there's going to be at least one Switch game we that is unexpected that we haven't heard about that will be yeah. a big release somewhere between now and the end of the year. And that will be somewhere in there that they've kept secret. I'm not going to, like, commit to it's Metroid Prime 4. It's, I I'm going, I am going to commit to it's not another Metroid Prime game. And it's not another Metroid game. Like, the only two, this is like, maybe they're making a 2D Metroid game for the 3DS. And no, they're not. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, any other Nintendo thoughts? Not really. Yeah, I kind of just agree with you. I don't think there's going to be anything super surprising there. I mean, they've had a good year so far. Yeah. You know, the Switch launch has gone very well. And, and yeah, so just shore up some things and that's what we'll get. Uh, I'm saving Microsoft for last. Okay. Because they're the clusterfuck here. Uh, EA, sports. Yes, we're going to get people talking about football and we're going to get people talking about football. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to get at least one celebrity from one of those sports, probably it's going to be soccer, up on the stage talking way too long about something. Hopefully this time it's like an actual player. I think like last year they had a fucking coach or someone up there. There was like at least the year before that they had Pele, who's someone, a soccer player, famous enough I had heard of him. It's yeah. like getting like your fucking, because I think they talked about like the manager mode in FIFA or something last year. Like there is nothing you could say in this world that more instantly just turns me off than FIFA manager mode. I know. Like, that's just... I'm sorry. I get that people really like that shit, unless, that's the guy I am. Unless it's a realistic FIFA manager mode and, like, you're ultra corrupt. Yes. Yeah. And no. Like, it, yeah. And you're, like... You know, you're, like, just, like, getting reports and about, like, oh, 20 people died in a cave-in and, like, building this stadium in the Middle East... Well, whatever. That's a fucking. You just like light it and smoke it and say, no, like, what "That's you, my business." We should just call the insurance company and cash the checks. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like yes, that 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 is the FIFA manager game I want. Like this is just dark, super fucking intense social commentary. Yeah. Uh, EA is the conference I always skip because nothing interesting ever happens at it. Um, I my bold prediction for this year's EA conference is they are going to. It is going to be Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. Yeah. I think, like, yeah. Battlefront 2 is absolutely going to be like the big thing they do at the end. I hope they do the same red carpet thing they did last year with Battlefield 1 where they get like fucking Snoop Dogg and Jamie Foxx and all these fucking Liz Khalifa, like all these people there that are all stoned out of their fucking minds and just show up and all play fucking Battlefront 2 on PC and then at the end you see that fucking Snoop Dogg got zero kills and zero deaths. Like what, what did you even do Snoop? Were you even playing the game? How is it? How did you not at least even die once? I, uh, you know, I, I listened to the Rooster Teeth podcast. Yeah, and I remember Bernie Burns from Rooster Teeth was at. He was yes, in that he group, was there, yeah. and he had a great story about it that he got high just from. He was sitting near Snoop Dogg, and he got high from contact fumes. I mean, there's and, like they literally they were shooting Snoop Dogg, and you saw him just put a fucking joint in his mouth and light it on fucking like live video. Like they just filmed it. Yeah, I want more of that. Definitely. Yeah. So if that the EA able... show was all that, like they had a high Snoop Dogg and Jamie Foxx hosting, I'd watch the shit out of it. That would be fantastic. But yeah, that's definitely what they're... They're at least going to show off a big multiplayer thing with yeah. Battlefront 2 at the end of the day. Then I think we're going to see, a, hopefully, at least a full trailer of the Amy Hinnig thing. That yeah. game that, like, from Visceral, that we saw, like, the briefest of snippets in the last... Like, we saw basically an animated GIF of it last year at E3. Because last year's EA conference was, like... We're making video games, and here's, like, a 15-minute, like, behind-the-scenes thing of, like, us talking about the video games we're making, and here's, like, a couple of animated GIFs, and it was like, and no, we're still not showing you a full, proper gameplay trailer of Mass Effect Andromeda, because we are fucking crazy. Yeah. And look how that turned out. Yeah, Mass Effect Andromeda never had an E3 trailer. No, it never had a proper E3 trailer. They only had do, E3 trailer. Do teasers. we hear from Bioware at all? I think there's a good chance that we hear whatever the new IP Bioware has been working on for a while is. Because okay. it's like they had the Dragon Age stuff, the Mass Effect stuff, and then there was like another studio that was just working on something new for a long time. I think there's a good chance we see a trailer for that. 
I don't know. Like, we're definitely not going to hear anything about Mass Effect. I'd be very surprised if we heard something about a new Dragon Age game. Too soon for that. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, Bioware is in a bit of internal conflict right now because the Mass Effect team basically got shut down. And, yeah. Or, well, well they haven't been fired. They're being moved around. Yeah, they're being moved to the other Mass Effect, or the other Bioware teams and yeah. working on other projects. Yeah, there's no plans for more Mass Effect in yeah. the future for mm-hmm. obvious reasons. Yeah. The new Need for Speed game will be there. There was a trailer for that that, that came out, like, a couple of weeks ago. And it just looks like they have finally conceded and said, fine, we're just going to turn Need for Speed into the Fast and Furious game. That's just what we're going to do. Because, like, that trailer looked like, if you told me that was a trailer for, like, a Fast and Furious spinoff game, I would have believed you. Nice. Uh, Bethesda. I have no idea what the fuck Bethesda is going to show. It's funny because Bethesda is 100% reliably one of the most interesting people at this yeah. show every year. I think they're one of the most fascinating publishers out there right now because if, a, if Bethesda puts their name on something... It's at least an interesting game. Yeah. As we saw, like, with Prey recently, which I haven't had the chance to play yet, but people like and is cool and different. Um, so, but they do seem to have exhausted all their games. Yeah, like, last year they had Dishonored 2, they had, like, Elder Scrolls Online, they had Prey. I think that was mostly it because that was, like, Fallout 4 had already come out. Because Fallout 4, that was the year that, like, they did the Doom and, like, Fallout 4 was, that's the year they started doing E3 stuff was two years ago. Yeah, they had a lot. Yeah. But, so, I mean, we're... I, I assume we're not seeing Elder Scrolls Six. No, it's definitely too early for a new like core game from that studio. I mean, they're definitely going to say something about some Elder Scrolls Online something that, yeah. that'll be there in some capacity. But like the Dishonored team can't be ready for more. No, and obviously because because Dishonored Two came out last year, Prey came out earlier this year. So yeah, I don't think there's anything from Arcane. Oh well, then we'll I, we'll almost certainly hear for the sequel of that Wolfenstein game because yeah. that was like kind that of teased at thing. the end of their last tra- uh, last conference. I want single player Doom DLC campaign. That's I want that too. It's not going to happen. You're if you don't don't hold your breath. I also like Something I would love Doom. I would love if there was a, just like a fucking trailer for Doom Two Hell on Earth and that was just what they were doing. I would do not think that that's what they are going to show here, even if they're making it. If they um, make that, do they stylize Hell on Earth all caps to match? Yes, I think okay. so. In my dream like landscape of it, yes, that's absolutely what you do. Okay. Yeah, I have no idea what the process is going to do other than that Wolfenstein game in, in Elder Scrolls Online. They, but, it, but that's why I said like last year, and then they ended up having like a pretty packed presentation. Yeah. Whereas like even if you know, you know, Prey and Dishonored two had long presentations last year, but like they felt significant and didn't feel like they were just filling time. Yeah, that'll be an interesting one to check out. Yeah. They're, they're always worth a watch. Uh, Ubisoft. Yeah, Ubisoft. Uh, who knows? Uh, the Just Dance 2018 will be there for sure. Far Cry 5. Far Cry 5 will be there for sure. Assassin's Creed Origins, does that get announced? Absolutely, yeah. yeah, that will be there. I wonder if, like, because that was just so heavily leaked, I would not be surprised if originally that was going to be at the end of the conference, and now it is not. Yeah. Because uh, I don't know, like... I know that they're like like Rainbow Six Siege, um, For Honor, and Tom Clancy's uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands has all have all done really well for Ubisoft. So I would not be surprised if like, um, and even like the Division. So I I would not be surprised if there was a lot of DLC kind of stuff at their conference for like the Division and Rainbow Six Siege and all those games. So there's a good chance of that. I'm sure um, we'll probably see some like small project from them because they like to do that every once in a while, like grow home. Yeah, they made all those announcements like they're doing a crew sequel and stuff. Maybe we see little bits and pieces. Yeah. Right, they are making a sequel to the crew for reasons well, nobody will ever understand. Do we get Watch Dogs three? No. Does Watch Dogs get annualized, Sean? I hope not. That would be that would be weird if they like what? had to sacrifice like they're like in order to get assassin's creed off of that they have to sacrifice another franchise they just made so it's like now they have to just destroy watchdogs on the no what we get is they did watchdogs one it was pretty okay and then they waited a couple of years did watchdogs two and next we get watchdogs brotherhood and watchdogs revelation yeah i'm All really except- excited for watchdogs revelations where they just add in like a bunch of items that just do the same things that items did already in the franchise and they're just like we're just adding another one that does that thing now <laughs> It's like, so now your fucking weapon wheel is just completely unusable. No, I want Watch Dogs X Assassin's Creed. No, I'm I mean, that's brave, that's, you know, the, the fucking Assassin's, or the Ubisoft Cinematic Universe. Yeah. Sure, that's where they go. I mean, do they announce the surprise Assassin's Creed movie sequel with Michael Fassbender <laughs> on stage 
being chained down in a Hannibal Lecter mask no, because he well, doesn't want to be there. What I hope is that they announce like the surprise, like straight to DVD sequel to Assassin's Creed that is starring Aisha Tyler, who has been like the hosting the conferences for Ubisoft for years now. And so she's on stage, and then all of a sudden, like she just like whips on an Assassin's Creed coat. And it's like I'm making an Assassin's Creed movie in my backyard, bitches. And you know what? Because it's a direct to DVD movie, it's also called Assassin's Creed Origins. <laughs> it's, yes, it is. Yeah, exactly. It's, it has no connection to the game. We actually, like, weirdly enough, we somehow don't have the rights to make a direct adaptation to one of the games we're, we're making because movie rights is crazy. But yeah, we're calling Assassin's Creed Origins. Yeah. Um, we'll see that South Park game, South Park, the Fractured oh Butthole. Oh my god. That's, that's becoming, like, that game has such a funny saga because it yeah. keeps almost coming out and then getting pushed pretty much exactly like the first one. Exactly. It's, it's the weird South Park video game curse. I don't know. So that will be there. I, I want someone to just strike South Park from the face of the earth. It I'm feels so like it's really the time has come. Like God, the time came years ago, but the time I, has more than just come now. I need I need someone to do the dissertation on how South Park enabled the rise of Trump. Yeah. Because I think it's worth writing. Yeah. And I need it to go away just like I need Trump to go away. Yeah. But they're not. No, no, yeah. Maybe it's, James Comey's testimony can get rid of South Park too. I mean, that's what I mean. That's that's what it all is. That's the real conspiracy. Actually, did, it has nothing to do with Russia. Did, did Trey Parker and Matt Stone collude with Russia in the production of the latest season of it's South like, Park? Did they collude with Russia? They are Russia. No, but yeah. So South we're getting Park, off track. We are getting very off track. South Park will definitely be there, and then. But the other, the interesting wrinkle is that weird Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle oh, right. crossover game. That like was rumored forever in such a way that I was like, you know, that was around the same time the Pokemon Stars rumors were coming out. And if you were to tell me one of those games was real and one of them wasn't, I definitely would not have said that the fucking like Rabbids and Mario like RPG Kingdom Battle crossover bullshit was the real one and the Pokemon Stars one was bullshit. Yeah, I guess the question is, do we see that at Ubisoft or Nintendo? I bet we see it at both. But I think yeah. that we're definitely like Ubisoft is going to have a big thing. I think about that, and then Nintendo probably have like another trailer or something. Yeah, but I think that's going to be there. All right, um, Microsoft is obviously going to be the show to watch this year, right? Yeah, because they have the Scorpio. We will find out what the Scorpio is called. We'll find out once and for all it is called the Xbox 1.5. <laughs> uh, I have heard someone on Twitter said, and I think it's this is probably likely that it will be the Xbox One Elite. That makes sense with yeah, what they've said before. Yeah, with like the, the Elite controller stuff. They already have branding for it. I still want Xbox 2. Yeah, I want Xbox that. 2. Or Xbox One 2 is my real yes. dream. Xbox 1.5 would be pretty fucking good, though. Is it is it Xbox One O-N-E 2-W-O? Or is it Xbox O-N-E and then, like, the Roman numeral 2? Yes, it's the Roman numeral 2. That, yeah. that one's better. Yeah. Xbox One 2. Two. It's like a flaming 2 from, like, Lord of the Rings. Or it's like, or they do the Arabic numeral 2, and it's like that with the weird Destiny 2 logo, where it's just this gigantic 2 that, like, crushes the Xbox One. I mean, Microsoft's in an interesting position. They have the Scorpio, and that makes them the big players this year. Yeah. But it's also that they have been floundering to degrees. I don't think I'd kind of properly realized until, like, I turned on my Xbox One recently and, like, realized I have not booted this system to play a single-player game in over a year. Uh -huh. I booted it to play, like, the last one that was even really a single-player game was Gears of War 4, but I played that all co-op online with my brother. Forza Horizon 3, I can play single player, but I tend to play it co-op online with my brother. And that's a great game. I'm not dissing these games, but it's like, they have completely run dry on exclusives. The big one last year that you would have hoped would have turned the ship around was ReCore, and that, like... Right. It's a good game, but it wasn't what they needed. And, like, you know, the, the Xbox Play Anywhere thing has worked out great, but they don't have... And, like, you just look at the sheer deluge of Sony exclusives in the first half of this year alone. Yeah. Like, it's nuts. You had Yakuza 0, Persona 5, Hero Horizon Zero Dawn. Gravity Rush 2. Gravity Rush 2. Neo. Neo is near. Uh, uh, near is not on Xbox. It's, it is on PC, but not okay. Xbox. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I should just start playing that. But anyway, um, yeah, so you have had so many. It's so overwhelming on the Sony side of things. And Microsoft just crickets for months. Yeah. And I feel like, to me, like, the Scorpio thing will be interesting. I'm fascinated in all of this. But what they need are games. Yeah. And they, what they don't need is Halo 6, Gears of War 5, Forza 7. Like, we'll get all that eventually. But, like, yeah. that's not going to save them. 
Well, they have uh, three for three industries did come out a while ago and say that Halo Five is not going or Halo, sorry Halo Six. Yeah, we're so we're we're high enough up in sequel numbers where it's hard to keep track which one we're on at this point with Halo. Now I feel like once you get past four, it's hard to remember. Yeah, um, but they, they said Halo Six is not going to be there. Like. Which is kind of interesting because I would have just assumed that this would be the year where they do the cinematic trailer and yeah. then next year's where they do the gameplay thing and then it comes out the year after that or, or it comes out later that year. Um, but Halo 6 is not going to be there. I've, obviously, if Halo 6 isn't going to be there, they're not going to show like a weird super early cinematic thing for Gears of War 5 because that just, yeah. 4 just came out. Forza Horizon 7 is definitely going not to be Not Horizon, there. Forza Motorsport uh, Sorry, 7. yeah, Forza, Forza Motorsport 7. It's because that one's even more because now we're on like Forza Horizon 4 it's a motorsport seven so it's yeah. like even their spin-off franchise is getting up there yeah that's the thing we're not going to see the next horizon i don't think because three just came no. out yeah no so we'll see the next main forza motorsport game i'm hoping that they do something dumb with like lowering a car on stage or like lowering it up from beneath the stage or something stupid that's like yeah. we partnered with toyota to the years like it's exclusively in our game this car that there's three of them made in the world and here's one of them on stage it's like okay nobody cares we'll see sea of thieves for the fourth year in a row or something yeah hopefully they'll they, hopefully instead of just doing a trailer that has a bunch of youtube people in it they just have a bunch of youtube people on the stage pretend to play the game while doing youtube people stuff like giving racist rants or some shit i hope that makes a strong appearance there one of them is talking about immigration one is doing nazi propaganda yeah it would be great like the real youtube influencer experience live on on stage man if they would never do that today now, right? Like, there's no. been, that was so naive last year, and now it's like, yeah, you didn't want those people there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but Sea of Thieves is definitely going to have some capacity. I have no perspective on when that game is trying to come out. I, um, I Look, Sea of Thieves, y'all know my love of, like, naval literature and stuff. There's a yeah. reason Treasure Island is one of my favorite books. I, I need that game to be good for me. Okay, yeah. And I want, like, a convincing... Are you, like, if they can't sell me on that, they're not selling anyone yeah. on it. Yeah, I so, don't know. But yeah, was, I just don't have a very good read on that game even yeah. after it's been at a couple of E3s now. I, this this is the year if they do not show Crackdown 3 this year after they did like a teaser trailer in like 2014 or some bullshit was the last time we heard from that game. Yeah. If it is not here, it is dead. There's yeah. just no way it skips this. I think there's a good chance that maybe the reason why it's been a no-show for a little bit is they're waiting to like use that to help show off like how cool the Scorpio is. Yeah. But if it is not here, it's officially had bullet in the head. There's no way that game comes out. Yeah, I mean, to me, the, what the Xbox needs more than anything else is not a hardware refresh. It's games. Yeah. And a, and a, and a clear reason for being. And I, I want to see that because... I, I don't feel like I don't know what the options even are. Like mm-hmm. I haven't heard the rumors. Yeah, I'd like to be surprised. That's what we need. But I just don't know. You know, they're not going to get another like Rise of the Tomb Raider after that fiasco. Right, Great game, yeah. but didn't sell well on Xbox because they released it the same week as something big and all this stuff. You're right. But like, yeah, I you know the Scorpio itself. We have a pretty good sense of what that thing is. I'm going to be interested to see how they pitch it. I'm going to be interested to see how much of a departure, if at all, it is from the Xbox One. Right, is like it, how analogous, like directly analogous, will it be to just the PS4 Pro for Xbox? Exactly. Like we know it's more powerful than the PS4 Pro, which opens up options for them. Like you know, what kind of controller does it come with? Um, what kind of UI is it running? Please, for the love of God, be a new one that that's not just a remake of like the fifth remake yeah. of the one we're on now. Yeah, I uh, I want them to announce they've fixed the controls on the DVD player. <laughs> That's not going to happen. I had to recently. My brother was using my PS4, and I had to watch a DVD on my Xbox One. I'm like, I don't know what button to push. For you anything. have to press X to pause fucking DVDs, and no app does that. It's like every fucking like YouTube or Netflix. You watch anything else on the Xbox One. Everything's pre- you press A to pause. You fucking watch a movie on that thing and you press X. It's the stupidest fucking thing in the world. I had totally forgotten about that until you just said it. I had a reason. See, but oh, no, I, yeah, uh, that sucks. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, the backwards compatibility stuff is chugging along. I, I wonder what other kinds of it. Yeah, I just. I, I assume the Scorpio is going to be a heavy part of it at the front, and then they're going to go into game demos showing off on the Scorpio. Yeah. 
You know, I mean, do you think there's any surprises around the Scorpio hardware for us to hear about? I don't think around the hardware. I think the only, like, sort of surprises would be, like, if they have any really, like, crazy policy choices to make around it. Which I don't, like, my guess is it's going to be more or less analogous to the PS4 Pro. I would be surprised if they had a new UI for it or something like that. Like, yeah. they might announce, oh, like, we're going to do a big UI refresh for, like, August or so. But they, like, they did the UI refresh relatively recently. So, yeah. I would not look well, for things on that front. Yeah, and, you know, the new UI is the best one they've had i don't want to make too much fun of it it's an improvement it's just i still don't know where to go for things because yeah. they've changed it so much uh over the years that i keep forgetting but anyway i yeah i mean you know do they have some because they're, they're so all in on like the scorpio is p- fucking powerful right they yeah. keep saying that are they going to shore up something like a universal boost mode which the ps4 pro got later on but not at launch yeah like that would be a cool thing to announce and just have ready I, w- I would guess that it probably has that at yeah. launch, so that like if you know it will run games smoother than they if it's just an Xbox One game by yeah. default. I would assume that. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. they're probably going to focus on it pretty heavily. You know, the Xbox One S already added some cool functionality like 4K Blu-ray stuff, right? And 4K case streaming, so that's already. But I would I would not be surprised if we see something about like multimedia stuff because of that. Hopefully they don't go back to, like, TV. Yes, we're making another Halo TV show. It's going to work out this time, we promise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. I, like, the thing that is most tricky about Microsoft is that, like, it's really hard to predict, like, what kind of games might show up there just because they do not have the kind of, like, bank of studios the way yeah. that Sony does. And, like, because the studios that Microsoft does have are, like, rare. We, we know that what Rare is working on. Maybe they have another studio working on another game. I would not expect that but it's technically possible and other than that like the studios working for them are all making forza or they're making gears of war like as they made you know they had that black tusk studios that they then just turned into the coalition that is the coalition that is just makes gears of war games and then they have like three four three industries that just makes halo games so it's like yeah. the studios that work for them are all just tied into specific franchises and so to get any other exclusive games like a record they have to reach outside of that and like hire someone and basically pay someone to make an exclusive game for them so it's very hard to kind of anticipate if there's going to be a big surprise in that regard um, at their conference. Absolutely, yeah. I, you know, Sony has a very clear identity right now. Nintendo, frankly, has a very clear identity yeah. right now. Microsoft is like the odd man out at the moment, and I just, I'm still skeptical that more power is the way that they're going to, you yeah. know, stand out. Because also, this is where we're going to find out for sure how much money the Xbox Scorpio is going to cost, and like that's going to be a big sticking point. If they can't get it in price parity with the PS4 Pro, I think they've got a fiasco yeah. on their hands. Yeah, and I'm guessing it's going to be $500, but who knows? Who yeah. knows? We'll see. I, I, I think if they come out of that announcing that at $500, they're going to be something of a laughing stock. Yeah. Unless like there's something super compelling, like every game guaranteed 60 FPS, which is impossible. Yes, so that I would don't. never happen. Like yeah. that would that would actually be one of those things where like it sounds great, but in practice it would oh, be, be disastrous horrible. because yeah. like developers would just stop making games on the Xbox One. Yeah. Anyway, uh, any other E3 thoughts? I'm really excited. I, I'm always very excited. Um, this I've, feels like a much less high stakes E3 than we've had in a couple years. Yeah, because I feel like things have kind of settled. But Microsoft has this weird ball in their court yeah. with Scorpio now. And I think there are like some question marks, like like VR, like even outside of just PSVR, like what kind of presence is VR going to have? Like I feel like the story on VR has gotten like really rocky over the past couple of months of where you hear a lot of stories about how a lot of sort of like uh, investment into VR has dropped dramatically this year because there's just not a lot of money coming in from there because the public has not adopted those headsets maybe as quickly as people wanted them to, which is not surprising considering how absurdly expensive they are. And that you can't make a good marketing photo of them. It's true. I'm yeah. just thinking of like for the larger public, if all they know is like that time cover of the fat kid jumping in a of VR Palmer screen. Lucky, the man who disappeared... All right, he had some some opinions. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about like the fucking racist people in the video game industry. Like they finally, Facebook finally were just like, yeah, no, we've completely swept him under the rug, and he has disappeared from the face of the earth now. He's we've swept him under the rug alongside our role in the 2016 election. Exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on and talk about Doctor Who. Doctor Who. All right, this week on Doctor Who, we've got The Lie of the Land by Jamie Matheson. That's not, not right. Nope, about to- by Toby Whithouse. Toby Whithouse. That's what happens when I cut and paste outlines and don't fix everything. There you go. All well, right. That's why I'm here. Yeah, The Lie of the Land by... I knew it was wrong as I started reading it, but I was already reading it. Yeah. Uh, no, Toby Whithouse. 
um, who has written for Doctor Who before, written some very good episodes and that shitty Western episode. Okay, so, yeah, he know. did write The Town Called Mercy. Yeah. Uh, anyway, spoilers from here on out. Yes. I found this episode disappointing. Me too. I don't think it's bad. No. I think we still have yet to, you know, remember that, like, bad Doctor Who is, like, the twin dilemma or love and monsters yeah. or the red terror or whatever that um, arcade is. The crimson was. horror. The crimson horror. The red terror. Pretty much the same thing. Yeah. That was close. That's bad Doctor Who. Yes. Bad Doctor Who is like, I mean, Doctor Who, like any proper episodic kind of show, yes. is a show built out of peaks and valleys, and those peaks can reach extraordinary heights like a heaven sent, and those valleys can plumb the deepest depths of hell like a twin dilemma. And, you know, we haven't even had this season, I wouldn't even put this in the category of, like, the boring episode, like no. Cold War, that yeah. Mark Gatiss one, where there's nothing wrong with it, it's just dull. Uh-huh. Like, it's not a bad episode, it's just a dull one. I still found The Lie of the Land very entertaining. Me too. I found it well made. I found it incredibly acted. A lot of good attributes. I also thought it dropped the ball about as hard as it could on the Monk stuff in terms of actually taking all this interesting thematic tonal material they had from the last three episodes, because I would include Oxygen at least as an intro into this, and did nothing with it. And the most frustrating thing for me in the entire episode is that they almost do something with it. Because yeah. early in the episode, you have this scene where Bill and Nardole... And I was loving the episode up to this point. They get on the ship, and they go to confront the Doctor, and the Doctor seems like he's been taken over by the monks. And I think Peter Capaldi is amazing in that scene. Pearl Mackey is especially amazing in that scene. And it did feel like a kind of a culmination of where the Doctor and her had been heading. Yeah. And I was so fascinated, like, man, where are they going to go with this? And where they're going to go with it is cheap regeneration thing. Haha, it was a joke. And Bill, for some reason, isn't even mad the Doctor fucked with her like that, which feels out of character for Bill a little bit. Yeah. And then they go and have a pretty standard Doctor Who adventure that is totally fine on its own if you ignore what it's coming out of. Yeah. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, that's basically exactly how I felt about it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's it's just one of those things where it's an episode that has a bunch of really good ideas here and there and can't quite focus on a single story to tell. And it's something where it's like... An alternate version of the episode's plot, which is like I don't love to do this kind of stuff of like like you know backseat kind of writing another episode, but I feel like this episode sort of invites that so heavily. Is the idea of like the Doctor, like for whatever reason, like you know monk mind control or whatever, is working for them in the way he is. It seems like at the beginning of the episode is doing all of that. And, but then instead of just sort of, like, having that be like, oh, like, I wasn't really, and now we can just go on the fun, sort of more standard Doctor Who adventure, it's like, no, because they had all these pieces set up to do this. Like, Nardole and Bill go and get the Master and have the Master, like, work with the Master to take down the Doctor. Like, that's a great fucking episode idea. Yeah. Like, that's, and they had all those pieces set up there to tell that story that, like you said, would have continued off of a lot of, like, the development that the Doctor has been going under. Of, I think, like, the idea of how, like... How under control is he, really? Because I think some of the arguments he makes when he's, like, play-acting or whatever, the villain, are pretty solid. And I think you can kind of believe, especially after he has been trapped on Earth for however long guarding this door. And is like, you you know, we definitely have this sense of he's very cooped up. He's very, like, antsy. He's taking a lot of dumb risks this season. That you could really buy this idea of, like, maybe he kind of just, like, just for a little bit is, like fuck it let's try this like let's like try like like you people keep on fucking all this shit up especially in a year where like with brexit and like donald trump and all this fucking horseshit going down let's try the like kind of dystopian to totalitarian society and i will kind of work to help make it better from the inside and see how this works i think you could totally have written that plot and peter capaldi sells that speech so hard at the beginning of this episode I think they really could have gone for it. He has that line, and it's it's a well written scene. That's the other thing. Like, I actually think that scene is too well written for its own good. Yeah. Because I think if functionally the scene is a trick, it's too well written. It's too well acted to be a trick, Um, because it sells you on something that the episode then completely reneges on, and that's bad. That's bad writing at that point. So I don't know what to do with that. But yeah, like he has that line in there about like you knew about fascism and you chose this anyway. That is a resonant line right yeah. now. I think the first half of this episode up to fake regeneration is resonant in that it's like, oh, I think the Trump references weren't an accident. This feels like something they were building to. Absolutely, yeah. And then, you know, the episode becomes much more traditional. There's bad guys in a tower and let's go fight them. 
Yeah. You know, and I don't want to completely discount that because there's some good stuff in that stretch. And I like, I think the episode builds to a very nice character moment at the end. I'm just not sure it's the character moment that belongs at the end of this string of stories. Yeah. But yeah, I I don't know. It it That's the other thing is just like pace-wise, that scene on the boat is the end of an episode. It's Absolutely, not yeah. it's not 10 minutes into the episode we get there and I was already feeling like where the fuck is this going? And also, did you watch this on BBC America? No, no. This was the worst I have ever seen for where they put commercials in on BBC America because uh, two in particular. One is after Bill shoots the doctor they went to commercial. Great. And and the regeneration was after that commercial break. That was weird. Because there's like a music cue going on through yeah. that. Like there's no break in that. And then the other one that was so ridiculous I couldn't even believe they did this. Was near the end of the episode when Bill is going to like hold her hands on the magical monk thingy. Yeah. And the doctor is on the floor and he's got like his hands bound and he's yelling. Midline, they just faded out, went to commercial, faded back in on him still uh, protesting and went on from there. That's those are the two worst cuts I've ever seen on the BBC. I know they have a hard job with yeah. this. You can do better than that. Like I at least would have done like there's two shots of him regenerating. One where he's like low on the ground and his hand is out, and yeah. then one where he stands up and does the whole thing. I would at least have put the thing between those two shots just yeah. to really fuck with people. You yeah. know? Yeah. But anyway, it, it is a weird. It's a really weird problem to have BBC America. Like I have all the sympathy for them. It's just yeah. like how the fuck do we edit commercials into a show that wasn't shot to have commercials? Yes. Um, yeah. Not their fault. It's just like those two were like oh, throw a dart on the edit timeline. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, what do you? The, that regeneration footage was used in every trailer. Yeah. For this season, which I feel like everyone like obviously he was. Everyone knows he's not going to regenerate because. We would have heard casting news and all that stuff that would have been well known. Yeah. But if, like you do at least kind of guess that like I think like the big guess that everyone would would have had is like that's how he regenerates his eyesight at some point. Yeah. And instead of like it is it feels like a slightly cheap gag that mostly like I don't want to just kind of accuse them of putting it into the episode just for the trailer, but that is what it feels like, whether that's what they uh, intended those, or not. Those shots are a lot better in the trailers than they are in the episode. They're mm-hmm. a lot more resonant. Uh, I think, yeah, I, maybe I don't want to accuse them of that, but that's exactly what happened. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a pretty cheap moment. I, I don't like that. Like, at least when Russell T. Davies did the big, like, cop-out regeneration, one, he made it the the cliffhanger to an episode, which yeah. was amazing, and then came back and actually had a semi-interesting solution to that problem that led to a plot of an episode. Yeah. You don't have to love every part of the plot mechanics from that, but if you're going to do fake regeneration, I thought he did it as well as he probably could. Yeah. This was not that. Yeah, yeah, it definitely felt just cheap and, and just kind of unnecessary. Also, even with everything that happened, why does Bill shoot the doctor three times? That felt unmotivated, I yeah. might say. I don't know. What else do we have to say about <laughs> some of that material? I don't, again, it's just something where it's it's a weird thing watching the episode because it feels like I kind of almost in places enjoyed the episode in spite of itself because yeah. I had so much fun imagining a different, better episode of Doctor Who with all the pieces they had of like, I, I tweeted this to you of this felt like an eighth doctor audio drama. And that's like, when I said that, like, I mean that to like the most specific elements of one, there are two really specific eighth doctor dramas that this draws from natural history of fear. And the last Lucy Miller one, that I can't remember the title of that's like very specifically like one, like natural history of fear is like dystopian future, the doctor you don't really understand when you go into it what is happening where the characters are and it's just like the doctor is working for some like totalitarian government and you have no idea why because you're just kind of dropped in the middle of this story it felt so much like that and then like also the whole just like either the whole feel of the episode of like hearing all these like like the broadcast by the doctor at the beginning and having the narration by bill over the course of it and then the whole scene where they're listening to her like say like oh this is all like the the monks are lying to you and all that stuff while they're doing the action scene like those are all like audio based elements that felt like like there's maybe actually literally was feel or feels like it was an audio based script at some point that then got turned into a tv episode because it's like i can see or like imagine all those scenes playing so beautifully in a big finish audio drama with like paul mcgann and all this stuff that then like work okay for the episode but feel like stylistically kind of odd like you don't usually have like companion narration in an episode and that kind of like makes like the it feels like that exists in this episode to sort of 
pave over pacing issues more than it's like feels really well justified the way it would it's in a, an audio drama. It's a better done version of what they did in Dune, which we talked about <laughs> earlier. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah, no. Because it is. It's there. It's paving over things. Yeah. It's, and it's okay. It works. It's. I, I like that it has that little emotional hook of her talking to her mom, which sets yes. up things for the yeah. end. So it's much more motivated than it could be. Um, you know, I enjoyed every scene of this episode. Like, there's no scene yeah. I would point to and be like, that was bullshit. I hated that. I enjoyed this episode immensely moment to moment. It's just it keeps not adding up. And yeah. it's for a couple of reasons. Like... So yeah, the premise that the episode establishes, it completely does away with 15 minutes in. Because even the idea... that So the thing about the Doctor being like on their side, that goes away right away. Yeah. And the mechanics of it don't really make sense and all that. But even like the sheer threat that the monks seem to possess in terms of like mind thought stuff never comes up again. So yeah. it effectively transitions into a different episode once the Doctor fake regenerates. And what comes from there, it also seems like maybe they're heading in an interesting, darker direction. Because they do have that scene with Missy. Great scene on its own, oh, I yeah, thought. Yeah. Michelle Gomez, I think, is better in every episode she's appeared. Yes. Just actively. And I thought that scene was like a great Hannibal Lecter scene. Mm-hmm. In that she's a little goofy. She's also pretty menacing. And, and in this form where she seems semi-earnestly wanting to be a better person... It was an interesting darkness going on there. Yeah. But does that add to anything later? No. Not really, no. no. I mean, I also like the like the, every scene is good in this episode, kind of on its own, is like the scene between the Doctor and the Master at the end of the episode. Yeah. The talking, like, that's a really good scene. Yep. And again, it's one of the reasons why I felt like, how fucking awesome would it have been to see, like, the Master have to... Like go up against the doctor, and like I think there's a really interesting idea in that master scene in the middle of the episode where she says, like basically, like your version of good is just arrogant. That like you know I'm like if I'm going to try to be good, that means you know her version of that is saving as many people as possible, and like you know taking this like small risk for a large reward, and that's like the good thing we can do here. And the doctor's like, no, I'm going to try to save every single life, no matter what even if that might ultimately result in everybody dying. And I think there's a really interesting dichotomy there that the episode doesn't explore at all. It no, just sort of like raises this idea in a really well-written, really beautifully acted scene, but then it has nothing to do with like the actual content of the episode. The ending of the episode is everybody gets out fine and everything's perfect and nothing bad happened. Yeah. And the ending of this episode thematically, both for the episode that is written and for the larger three-parter it is a part of, should be something a shoe drops you know a one thing i was thinking might happen that would be a fairly elegant ending to the episode would be the doctor does the mind thing and loses his eyesight again right yeah like frankly that would be like yeah that would make sense like there's something he has to give in order to let this be taken away and what happens is that and he goes back to being blind or something and no because it does feel like the whole theme of this three-part up to now is no you can't just have the magical happy ending and my biggest disappointment with this episode is it does kind of retroactively cheapen parts of the last few episodes in that the message of this episode is it's really easy to solve everything. And I, I think that's not so not where the other episodes were going. Yeah. It feels very incongruous to me. Yeah, although like the one sort of nice thing about how they have handled this three-parter is I feel like the last two pieces have stood on their own well enough that like yeah. I don't think this episode makes them retroactively like bad in the way that some older style two-parters could have where it's like the setup was kind of interesting and then the execution is so bad that when you rewatch it you can't enjoy the setup at all because you just know what the execution is whereas i think like you know even if they set up the next episode in like big dramatic ways both extremists and the pyramid at the end of the world work totally fine as their own stories they do extremists especially yeah the one thing you know if i were to rewatch pyramid at the end of the world you know the entire thing at the end is predicated on The Doctor is getting his sight back at the cost of something really bad happening. Right. And when the payoff to that is the staples button, that was easy, which is what the end of this episode is, that bothers me a little bit. Okay, yeah. That's not good serial writing. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, I I have a couple thoughts on this because this feels very much like a kind of thrown together script from a lot of different pieces. And, you know, it's got Toby Whithouse's name on it. And I'm sure you know, he wrote it. Yeah. But it is weird. Like, if I were Stephen Moffat, I would take this episode, f- 
close off that story how I wanted, and I'd let Toby Whithouse write an original story. Yeah. Because I kind of doubt Toby came up with this one on his own, and it somehow just fit with the... You know what I mean? Like, yeah. This clearly was part of a larger story, and the Peter Harness of it for the second episode made sense, because he's written that kind of episode before. So you give him that one. Yeah. This one felt like, that's not in this guy's wheelhouse. Like, I felt a little cheated of, like, I like Toby Whithouse's episodes, even when they don't work, like the, the cowboy one. Yeah. They're at least different and interesting, and I'd like to see him just come up with an original story. When you, know, when you have the guest writers on Doctor Who, that's what you want. Yeah. And they didn't do that with this one, so I found... And maybe that's just part of it is, it didn't feel like there was a sense of kind of authorship to this episode to me. Which I feel Extremis and, and Pyramid and certainly Oxygen all very much have. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, one other thing about the episode that, like, I like the idea of, but feel like the episode could have, like, done so much more with is the resolution to the episode, like, hues, like, really closely to the, like, save the day with the power of love idea, which is, like, generally one of, like, the worst things you could possibly do in Doctor Who. And I don't think they fully justify it here, because it's a hard resolution to justify. But I think, like, they actually had a good, like, opening to it that like i think it's again it's mostly like on the back of like bill and and or uh yeah bill and, and the doctor and like the acting there is so strong that you kind of can buy the idea but i love that what she has to do is sort of like overwrite the mind control or whatever with her memory of her mother but the thing that is unique about it to this version of that kind of idea is that she never knew her mother and like the whole, like, them trying to be, like, the fake news thing, which I feel like they don't fully justify that idea of, like, the, how much they sort of, like, raise that specter for this plot. They, they give, like, kind of everything of this episode. They don't really kind of execute on it. But the idea of her having to beat out that with, like, these memories she has of her mother that she has, like, deliberately made for herself based on photos and, like, projections onto her mother. There's something about that I really love. That I feel like could, again, if, like, executed better would have been a great resolution that would have managed a save the day with power of love ending and actually done it elegantly. Absolutely. I, there's kind of three or four different versions of this episode coexisting. Pick any one of them. Great yeah. episode. I They're all good ideas. They just, like, this episode kind of is cut into thirds for me, and they're all different drafts, almost, you know? And they, they didn't feel like, like this script got into good shape before they shot it. Because, yeah. you know, well-directed, well-acted, all of this, you know, the production design is good, the, the monk looks creepy at the end there. Uh, yeah. The other thing is, what did the monks want? That's one thing, like, I wish we had gotten somewhere right. along the line is like, all right, they took over Earth. Why? I was expecting someone to say at some point, like, we want your oil or something. I don't know. But, like, you know, we need your gold. I, I don't know. But there was no, like, the monks, I think, are a wonderful monster design and have a lot of good ideas and ultimately added up to very little. Yeah. In this it, it, it really it does ultimately feel like, and this is basically what it is, like, these three episodes were written by three different people because the monks yeah. are three very different monsters in all three episodes. It's I, like, it, it, it's something where... I like there's parts of that structure that I enjoy. Like I said, I like that a lot of the episode elements of these episodes stand on their own. So like Extremis works as its own episode entirely, and that's cool. But then also it feels like maybe if there were stronger direct ties here and like more of a like sense of you know maybe if like Stephen Moffat had more of a writing presence in the other two episodes or something to like more closely tie them all together, there would have been a better sense of like continuity of the monster and the like ideas continuing through them. Yeah, I, I agree. I, you know, there is a part of me that, as much as I enjoyed Pyramid at the end of the world, as much as I like elements here, I kind of wish Extremis just was its own standalone. Me too, yeah. And you moved on because it's like, then that episode is a fucking legend. Yeah. It's like, that's when Doctor Who just did it. Yeah. And then moved on. And then you have these next two. Doesn't make Extremis less of an episode, but I think it is less of a presence because of that. Is yeah. that fair to say? A little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, I think, yeah, my my crazy idea for extremists of, like, man, what if they just ended this idea or this episode and it was just, like, you just assumed that the Doctor saved the day off camera, that would have been a better setup for yeah. this stuff and, like, just a better version of that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I feel like they kind of got the more traditional season finale stuff out of their system here. Yeah. Which makes me very curious about the finale. Because I think everything they've set up with Missy, I am so on board with. I want to see where that's going. It feels very, very confident to me in a way where I really want to see what Moffat has up his sleeve. Because it doesn't feel like he's riding by the seat of his pants on that stuff. 
So I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, and you know, hey, Doctor Who is still in healthy shape. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> like this is this is not a big deal. Is this like one episode being a bit disappointing? And then next week we got Mark Gaddis. We get maybe he'll finally do it this time. Maybe he'll really knock it out of the park. His Robin Hood episode was good. His Let's, Robin Hood episode was it was a good episode. It was if, very funny. If we can get to that level, I'm okay. But I, I have to say, like, because I had kind of forgotten that the next episode was going to be his episode for the season until the next time preview where it was the Ice Warriors were on Mars and they're like Victorian era like red coat British soldiers on Mars fighting Ice Warriors. I'm like, this is the most fucking Mark Gaddis ass preview for a Doctor Who episode I have ever seen. Holy shit. Yeah, I, he had the weak link last season with Sleep No More. He'll probably have the weak link this season. But hey, maybe it'll be better. Who knows? Yeah. Mark Mark Gatiss has never written an episode, I'd say, like an A+. Plus, but no. I really like that Robin Hood one. Yeah. The Charles Dickens one is okay. And I don't like any of the other ones. So, And he's written a lot. So that's not a good track record. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think you could say a lot of things about why season seven is bad. And one of them is that it is the only season that has two Mark Gatiss episodes. And that's... You know, I, again, like, I think he is... Here's the thing. I like the guy. He's a good actor. Like, he has written good stuff. And he has, he's written some good episodes of Doctor Who, and he's written good stuff outside of Doctor Who. You know, like, he wrote that Adventure in Space and Time thing for the 50th anniversary yeah. about the uh, William Hartnell and all that. That's fantastic. And so it's like, I love the guy. It's like, you can definitely feel that the reason why he writes episodes of Doctor Who every season is that he's like the guy that Stephen Moffat can just go to and say I just need you to write an episode of Doctor Who and rely on it being a certain level of quality that you can just accept it and be like I'm not, I'm not going to have to stress out about this script I can just fucking throw it in there and it will be it will be at least fine here's the thing so those two season seven episodes he did was Cold War and Crimson Horror yeah all things considered I would rather be on the Crimson Horror end of the uh-huh. spectrum because that's a terrible episode, but it's memorable and entertaining in its awfulness. Yeah. And Cold War, the only thing I remember is that Clara thought that TARDIS was mad at her, and that's when they still hadn't figured out Clara. I mean, Cold War is where they brought back uh, the Ice Warriors for I the know. first time. So They're we're, not we're memorable. Getting, we're getting the Ice Warriors again, which is like, I've always... I liked the Ice Warriors in classic Doctor Who, even though they were, weren't around for much. It was like the second Doctor and third Doctor era, and I think that's it. And so it's cool to bring them back... Like, I don't know, though. Like, I don't know if it's... I, I feel like the Ice Warriors would have been great if they had a, you know, Silurian-style sort of episode to bring them back. That was, like, not the greatest episode in the world, but a real good meat and potatoes kind of Doctor Who episode that reintroduced this monster with, like, a cool new modern design. And that's not what we got, so... You know what I really want Mark Gatiss to do on Doctor Who? What? I want him to act. and spe- Yes. Because he hasn't been in the show, which is weird. And I specifically want him to do a master regeneration. I think he could be a phenomenal master. Yes, I want him to grow a beard. Yeah, because his beard is awesome. Yes. He would be able to do, like, he would be able to do some of the humor, but I think he would be menacing and, like, a stiff, upper-class British kind of old-ass master. I think that one day I would like to see that more than I would like to see him write Doctor Who scripts. (laughs) Yes, I am with you. That would be good. (laughs) Anyway, uh, The Empress of Mars. I like that title. We'll see how it goes. That's next week. Yes. You want to talk some Twin Peaks? Hello! <laughs> All right. Twin Peaks Part 5. If you haven't seen it, go see it. it yeah. Make sure you see the other Twin Peaks stuff. Don't watch it on its own. <laughs> or, or, I mean, I feel like watching Twin Peaks Episode 5 without seeing the first four episodes for the revival is much like watching Dune without reading the book. <laughs> Pretty so, much. You know, if you want to have that kind of experience and be like the... You know, have that because you can only have that experience once. Once you watch the first four episodes of Twin Peaks, you can't be the one person in the world that watched episode five, and that's it. Yes, that's true. All right, part five. This is coming back. We we had all four episodes came out the same night two weeks ago, and then they did not air on Memorial. Well, they aired the the parts three and four on Showtime proper, but they didn't air new ones. Yeah. And so now we're finally back with a new episode. We're going to have one a week until the finale, which will be two episodes, which means we have twelve weeks left. Of Twin Peaks, which is a lot. Yeah, Jesus. So great. 12 weeks, 13 hours. But this is part five. Still written and directed by... Uh, well, written by Mark Frost and David Lynch. Directed by David Lynch. And, uh, yeah. I uh, Spoilers from here on out. Whatever the hell that means to you for Twin Peaks. <laughs> yeah. um, so, here's a really quick establishment of what I felt about this episode. Okay. This here is the same light as the Leftovers finale. Right. And because it was the last episode ever of the Leftovers, I prioritized that. 
and watch that live. And then I wound up writing a long piece about The Leftovers. And so by the time I got to watching Twin Peaks, it was like 12.15. Yeah. And I, I wasn't sure I was going to stay up for it. But then I was like, I don't want to... Spoilers I don't care about, but I don't want to see like an image from this episode in my Twitter timeline. So I'm going to watch it now before I like come out of my media cocoon I've been in all night where I have not looked at Twitter or anything. Yeah. And so then I watched episode five of Twin Peaks. Loved it. Yes. And my reaction is, I mean, and here's the thing, I'm coming off of The Leftovers, which is a uh, show that I think has a lot of optimism in it, but is also a fairly somber show and a show that makes you reflect on dark things. So I was in a certain mood and Twin Peaks, about five minutes in, I, I started laughing. I'm like, yep, this is, this is, I'm back in that. And I think this episode is 100% of a piece with the first four. Yeah. You could have aired it that same night, and I would have been like, A+. Plus, or a plus love it. Love yep. it. And uh, I have seen already some people starting to like sour on this of like, why isn't Cooper good Cooper yet? And all I can say is, one, I understand. Yeah, I but, understand. But two... I couldn't be loving this anymore. It's so good, Jonathan. It's so good. It's so fucking good. Like, man. And clearly, I think it's useful to, like, have this fifth episode and, like, our first one where it's just one hour for the week. Yeah. Because it gets you a sense of, like, yes, I actually think this show has been pretty good in these first four parts of, of having episodes that do on some level feel like episodes. Like, there is some movement within them. Yeah. It doesn't feel like they just randomly cut an hour of footage out. It feels... A little more purposeful than that, but this still is very clearly, this is an 18-hour experience. This is, you're not going to get what you want right away. This is not about instant gratification. This is about, to me, you sit down and watch an hour of Lynch wackiness and let it take you where it will take you. Yes. And if you're in that mindset, I actually thought this episode had, uh, like, almost zero plot momentum. We can talk about that. But some individual scenes were out of this world good, once again. There has, there has not been an episode of the revival yet that I have not found worthwhile in terms of at least some scenes were outstanding. No, yeah, yeah. Um, is there any in particular you wanted to start with on this one? Um, I think like the thing that that stands out for me is the just we finally find out what the therapist dude has been doing yes. the whole time, Doctor Jacoby, Doctor Jacoby, have notes. Been in the woods. Where to recap? In episode one, the first thing we see is him standing there in the middle of nowhere with a cabin, getting a shipment of shovels. Later, we cut to him, and we have a very long sequence of him putting all the shovels up and spray painting them all gold. And I will now remind the viewers that when we talked about the first four episodes of Twin Peaks, I said that my idea of what I would love if that led to was that all he was doing with the shovels was buying the shovels, spray painting them gold, and then selling them for more than he bought them to make a profit. And what do we find out he's been doing in this fucking episode? He's been doing exactly fucking that on top of using a whole insane conspiracy radio thing to like, like create this persona about how America is filth and shit and you need to like get out of your mind and like fucking rise up and buy my fucking gold shovels and holy shit is the best thing. It's amazing. Here's some quotes. We're sinking down deep in the mud, and the fucks are at it again. And then he goes on about a global corporate conspiracy. You can't see it without a flashlight. Guess what? I've got one! Yeah, he gets his flashlight out. Oh my god. Basically, he's doing Twin Peaks Alex Jones. Yes. But he's not good at it. (laughs) Or he's amazing at it. This is also, in that sequence, is the first we've seen of Nadine. Yep. Coming back for the return, and she's just sitting there quietly listening to him, and that's all we see from her. That's great, and I think it's Jerry Horn. It is Jerry Horn. Yeah. In the middle of the woods, smoking marijuana, also listening to him. And those are like the people we know are listening to this, yes. the mad ramblings of Dr. Jacoby and him trying to sell them his fucking golden shovels. For twenty nine ninety nine. It's, man, that's... And I, I have in my notes, you can see, in all caps, he's selling the shovels, Sean was right. Oh my god, this is amazing. Yeah, I've like, literally when that happened, I just screamed out loud, I fucking called it! Because I fucking called it. Oh, it's amazing. It's great. It's wonderful. It's I love it. It's such a good scene. It's such a just unbelievable payoff for us, like, slowly just spending time with him, being like, what the fuck is... Because there's nothing about that character specifically that tells you that that's what he would be, like, 20 years later, and yet somehow it still makes perfect sense to me. I don't know why. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. I, yeah, I mean, it is a hilarious scene. I love the slow build to it. 
part of me hopes that's the last we see of him. And yeah. that's just that was his story in the Twin Peaks revival. Maybe that's all we see of Nadine. Just for fun. Yeah. Nothing against Nadine. I'd be happy with more Nadine. But like it's just such a funny way to have her character be in there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's that was good. That was such a good scene. As good as that is. Yeah. Not my favorite thing in this episode. No. My favorite thing in this episode. There is a shot in this episode that I would rank among the best shots in anything Lynch has ever done. Yeah, I think I, I know what shot you're talking and about. And I don't say it lightly. Uh, we meet a character played by Amanda Seyfried in this episode. Yes. She, we think, but we don't know, is Shelley's kid. Yeah, seems like. Or some, maybe Shelley's niece. I don't know. Something like that. And Shelley comes in. And we, we meet this character played by who I thought was Kieran Culkin. It's not. It's a guy named Caleb Jones who looks even seedier than one of the Culkins. And he's like got that scene where he's doing the job interview and he's yeah. done a terrible job. It's a really good scene. Yeah. And basically uh, he and uh, Amanda Seyfried are married or something. They're in love. And they have the same name in the credits. So I assume they're married. And they're doing drugs together. And so she comes in basically to get drug money from her mom, from Shelly. And then she goes out in the car and they do drugs. And then you have this overhead shot on Amanda Seyfried as he's pulling out of the parking lot. Like the car is moving but you don't, it's all tight on her, but with like a fisheye lens. It's like yeah. a very wide angle lens. She like leans her head back, back on the headrest and kind of stares up above the camera. Yeah, and you see kind of some of the red velvet in the car, very much the Lynch fetish of like the kind of car material yeah. you would have. And she's listening to music. The music cue is so perfect. And I, I like Amanda Seyfried. I think she's a good actress. I've, I would recommend her in a couple different movies. This is the most alive she has ever been on film. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying that as an insult. I've heard some people speak of that as like, that's the best thing she's done. And I don't want to say it like, ironically, like as an insult to her. That's just an incredible little like short story of acting. Is Because we've seen a hundred times the shot of someone does drugs and feels ecstasy. Yeah. That was not a version of that I've seen before. Where this like kind of timid young woman... Just like, it's like she's seeing the whole world, and instead of Lynch going crazy and show us what he's seeing, it's this weird shot on her with the music. I think it is a rapturously good shot. Yeah, me too. Yeah, like that definitely stood out to me in the moment of like, that kind of shot where you're like, I don't, like it feels like I must have seen this shot in a movie before, but I can't think of where I would have seen it. No, I again, like... There are elements in there that are common to, like, the kind of traditional dr person does drug shot. Yeah. But as with most things, Lynch just has a slightly different eye on it. And I do think, like, the choice of lens and the way she's surrounded by the car material and kind of how the camera is on her, but she's not looking into the camera lens. She's kind of off in her own world. The performance is so good. The music is so good. Yeah. The it's, way that, like, elements around the, like, edge of the frame sort of, like, suggest the idea of movement, but you're, like, still so locked on her creates, like, this weird kind of out-of-body sensation. It's like one of those great, you know, scenes from, like, Blue Velvet where they sing, you know, the Sandman song. Yeah. Or yeah. in Mulholland Drive, some of the stuff at, like, the <laughs> No I Banda or something like right. that. Like, it's just a great, iconic David Lynch moment. And I think leads us into one theme I identified in this episode that I wanted to talk about, which is that, so we have this pairing, the Amanda Seyfried character and the Caleb Jones character, who are kind of like this generation of, like, Laura Palmer and Bobby. Sure. You know? Is yeah. kind of one of the things I thought. And then you have, in the Roadhouse later, you have um, that group of girls. Jane Levy is among them. There's a lot of celebrity yeah. appearances in this episode. And so there's got a group of teenage girls. And then the douchebag teenage guy who basically assaults one of those women. And so you also have like a group that also kind of is an echo of different char younger characters from Twin Peaks. And again, this is all moving very slowly. But I like that we're starting to get into... We're not just going back to Twin Peaks and seeing the old characters again. I think there's a theme emerging of like a second generation or a third at this point going through similar things as the older people have. Yeah. And I'm interested to see where that's going. And I feel like that's becoming much more prominent with each episode. Yeah, me too. And I love the way they've, they've done it um, is like... And you really feel it in this episode is you get like... You know, the first the scene you get with, like, the deadbeat boyfriend or, or slash husband or whoever of at the job interview, like, you have no context for that scene when you get it. And you just get this very strange scene of this guy in this office and this, this like, deadbeat asshole comes in and the guy just chews him out and says, like, get out. He's like, you're, like, you know, your resume is the worst resume I've ever seen. I've been doing this for, like, 20 years. Just get the fuck out of my office. This is, like, a great little scene 
And then you don't see anything from that for like 15 to 20 minutes, and then you get the context for it later. And then also you have, like you said, the scene in the roadhouse with like the asshole at the um, at the bar, who's in, like he's smoking. And like you right have, next to a no smoking yeah, sign. Yeah, right next to the no smoking sign. It's like you don't have any context for that scene in the moment, and you don't even like get any more context later in this episode. There's a chance we'll never get more context for what that thing is. I have no idea. But I like there's this it's almost kind of like Mulholland Drive of the sense of just sort of like disconnected moments that maybe will build up to something, maybe will not, but it sort of has this sense of flow and pacing to it of you just kind of dropping into these little brief scenes in this world that kind of give you this sense of the sort of the dysfunctional element of like the relationships and of like the existence of these people in this world and how, you know, there's like the very seedy, just like they're addicted to drugs or they're always smoking. They're always drinking. Like there's this very like kind of like underworld seedy, just like a sense of addiction all over the place. And you also get that with like all the stuff with the casino is there's like, this is a world that like we keep on dropping into all these different elements of addiction everywhere. And we're like the, the woman who's addicted to like, fucking morphine or whatever in the one house across from the car well and here's the thing clearly everything is connecting yeah and maybe i shouldn't say everything clearly many things are yeah. connecting we you know who knows we're only five hours in that's one other thing i would say like i understand some people's frustration with the pace i guess we're a very small percentage we're not even a third into this yet. yeah you know and i do think a lot of ground has been covered but there's a lot of ground left to go much more ahead of us than behind but anyway like at, with every episode and with every passing scene a lot of pieces that I might have assumed would stay disparate are not. Yeah. You know, like, I think in certain Lynch productions, the scene with the, the weird douchebag drug kid who, like, goes in and doesn't give a good resume, there are, there are versions of that in Mulholland Drive where that never connects. Yeah. That pretty quickly connects. And I think there's, there's a lot of things where you can feel like there's a lot of net out there right now, but I think it's coming in and connecting in different ways. So, for instance, early in the episode, we have that scene with the coroner, which is amazing yeah. because she has, she's, like, she's like a stand-up comedian. She says on the weekends, she says, cause of death. This one took me a while. Someone cut his head off. Yeah. And she's just like this dry asshole coroner. I love that character. I want yeah. her to have a spinoff. Anyway, but what you get there is that the ring in that murder... And this is the murder victim, like the bottom half of the murder victim from yeah. the first episode. And the ring they found in his stomach is Dougie's wedding ring. Dougie Jones. Yes. Our favorite Dougie Jones. So again... We still have not fully known all the threads of South Dakota, except that Evil Coop is involved. Yeah. But this is another sign, like, no, Lynch and Frost aren't forgetting about those things. So that's interesting. Um, you know, and I think the later stuff where we get back to Twin Peaks and get some threads coming together. Again, if you accept that it's going to happen at a glacially slow pace, there are, you know, there is movement. Yeah. And, like, I just, I feel very satisfied with the movement we yes. get. Because it just feels... It feels very intentional. None of it feels like it is padded. Like it, no. it feels like we need to live in these moments. You know, there's, and it's all. I feel like it's defined in the walk of Agent Cooper. The just unbelievable, mind-numbing, just inhumanly slow shuffle that Kyle McLaughlin is being forced to move at. It's like it's almost like a metaphor for this whole series at this point. It's just like you have to accept the pace or get out. Because if you just if you can't get with the pace, you're not going to get something out of it. But if you can just accept the ludicrousness of how he has to walk, like you just get to breathe and live in those absurd moments and have so much fun with it, you know? Yeah. So let's talk about Zombie Coop. Yes. There's a lot this episode. We have yet another full episode where he is Zombie Coop. No. Or however we want to call him. Dougie Coop. I don't know. But and here's the thing again I can understand if you get frustrated with it I'm not going to blame you for that no this is a weird show but I enjoyed it so much it's so good it's so funny it's just it is again it's another episode we get of just moments of where you keep on thinking like he's yes. finally snapping out of it and he never really does he's it's, so trolling us yeah the thing where it's like agent yeah. agent and it's like no he's not going to snap out of it he's accumulating these things maybe but we don't know and I definitely thought, like, there were enough... The thing is, the comedy routine has had enough variations on it going on. Like, this one where he's... Now he's off in the city, and he has to get in the elevator, and he steals the dude's coffee, and he has to go into a meeting. Like, they push it so far in this episode that I actually think it's not just random comedy. Yeah. I think there's something of, like, a Lynch social satire going on here, where you basically have this ambulatory vegetable going through the motions of an average, like, American patriarch... 
And somehow he stumbles through all of it up to and including standing in the hall, clutching his groin because he doesn't know how to go to the bathroom. And if you can kind of accept the weird alt reality of the Lynch Twin Peaks universe, it's both hilarious and kind of piercing of that yeah. nobody notices this. Like it is this weird satirical thing. And maybe satire is too strong a word because spoof works also. Yeah. But either way, I think it's a good spoof. And like it is it is this sense of like you just kind of keep on waiting for somebody to come up to him and just like kind of take control of the situation and be like, look, Dougie, you are clearly not okay. Because <laughs> everybody like you have met for the past fucking like week or whatever, like the, the 50 people have walked up to you or you have like stumbled up to them have all been like, are you okay? And then you don't answer them and then they just kind of go on with it anyways. It's like, I want someone, there needs to be someone at some point or maybe there doesn't, but who knows. Who just says, are you okay? And doesn't take silence for an answer. just like, I'm just going to take you. And like, we're going to figure this situation yes. out together. Dougie, okay? Like, this is clearly... This is this has gone on long enough that this is abnormal. You know, that like his wife doesn't figure it out. All the people in his office doesn't figure it out. His, his wife doesn't figure it out. But in the scene where she's trying to get him in the car, Naomi Watts has one of my favorite line readings of the series. Where she says, okay, Dougie, you're acting weird as shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great line reading. And, but, like, and another thing in like, all that stuff that I love are the little tiny ways that, that Coop just disturbs like the normal sort of routine of life that you don't think about. That's like It's not just like the big things he does. It's like when he gets out of cars, he never closes the door behind him. It's just like such a tiny thing. And it just like is that little bit of inconvenience and that little bit of where Naomi Watts has to do and be like, oh, God damn it. And lean over and like, I'm like grasp for the car door handle and like shove it in from across the seat. And, it's, and when he goes into the elevator and he's just standing the wrong way when there's only like three people in the elevator, it's just like, Wrong! It's just wrong! And it's like weirdly unsettling to see someone Again. just defy the just basic, tiny, little, convenient, like, standards and, like, etiquette of society, and he just doesn't obey them. And those are the things that have the most impact to me. And Kyle MacLachlan is so good. He's so game for this. Yeah. The scene where, and it, it bookends the episode, but he, he's going through the courtyard and he sees that statue with the gun. Yeah. And he looks at it and raises his hand and does like the gun motion, but it's also kind of a thumbs up. Yeah. It's so funny and it's so like, it's so precisely observed in every motion he's making. Like, you can tell both he and Lynch are just having a ball with it. Yeah. And I love and I love that they went back to that for the credits for this one. Is yeah, standing there, and the credits also just felt like another commentary on like the delayed gratification because you're like maybe at the end of the credits he'll do something. Nope. nope. Yeah, and there's because again it's the other like little things of like of course he's like I don't even know if he's ever going to like if Naomi Watts is ever even going to show up again later in the series like that might be the end of that character because how the fuck is he ever going to get back there now like yeah. he has no means unless she finds him. He can't get back. It is that, like, this, it's little tiny things that you realize when someone is totally unresponsive, of course they're not going to, like, understand or, like, obey these little tiny things of, like, if he had, if, like, a normal person would say, oh, can you pick me up or call someone or get a taxi or something, and he just stands by the statue for reasons no one will ever know. Yeah, it's great. Two other funny moments. Yeah. One, I love that Frank, the guy whose latte he stole, yeah. gets winds up with the green tea latte. He acts like a kid about it, like, I don't really want it. And then he drinks it and just gets the biggest <laughs> smile. That is funny. It's a really great moment. That's funny. Uh, and Dougie has a mystical lie detector now. Yes, yeah. That's interesting. That's another one of the moments where you think, oh, maybe he's starting to snap out of it. Is he, like, he, like, sees whatever vision or whatever bullshit he sees is, like, he's lying. And just doesn't respond past that point and again it's one of those where it's like how how do none of these how does someone not just say okay this is too weird this is too no 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 dougie this is too, you can't just accuse someone of lying and then not respond to anybody's questions and then get pulled into your boss's office and he hands you a bunch of case files and you just go case and that's it yep yep no it's, oh. it's so good uh, Kyle MacLachlan also playing Evil Cooper. Yes. Let's talk about some Evil Cooper scenes. Oh, right, yeah. he's great in this. There's that scene where he's in his cell, and the guy's coming with the food, and he looks up and says, 
and now food is coming. Yeah. And it's he's got just these weird dark line readings. And then there is the big scary scene of the episode where you have the the flashback to the end of season two where you have um Killer Bob yeah. and, and Cuba, Donald, it, yeah, yeah in, the Cuba in the red room. It's like yeah. ha, 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 like that yeah. scene. And they went they did it over and over yeah. and over. But then he's looking in the mirror and his face winds up morphing with Frank Silva's, the, the late Frank Silva who played Bob. Yeah. But it happens over such a long period of time. At least I couldn't quite yeah. tell what was happening. And the scary moment is when it snaps back. Mm-hmm. Because you don't realize how much it's morphed. That was a great scare. And then I thought that the line he gives there, he leans and says, Good, you're still with me. Yeah. I like that. That yeah. was a good scene. Yeah. Yeah, all this stuff with Evil Cube has been really good. It, it's just like... It's really impressive the way you can feel, even though we never got like that much from Frank Silva playing that character, you can feel his presence in like the body language element of it. Yeah. It's a really impressive performance. The other evil Cooper scene. Yes. Is the scene at the end where he gets his phone call. Mm-hmm. And we have uh, Bill Buchanan from 24 as Warden Murphy. Right, yeah. Go deep with the cuts there. And uh, he makes this call, or he's, he's looking like, he's trying to decide who to call. He says, I don't think I'll call Mr. Strawberry. Strawberry. Yeah. He's not taking calls. And Bill from 24 is like totally frightened. Yeah. Great line of dialogue. And then Darth Coop gets a phone call and does something that sets off alarms all over the prison. And then well, he's, I love just, he's just like mashing on the keypad. Just, yeah. Bada, 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 bada. yeah. And he does that. Like, kind of like what he did with the Microsoft Surface. He yeah. has mystical technology powers. And all he says into the phone during all that is the cow jumped over the moon. He hangs up. It all stops. It's a weird, great little moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, other notes. We got more establishing shots in this episode, including <laughs> Buenos Aires. The establishing shots are really good. Yeah. They're very good. They're very weird, but they're good. Um, let's see. We had a scene. I'm going backwards a little bit. The new agent, Agent Tamara Preston, who's like the hot young agent at right. the FBI. We didn't get Gordon Cole this week, but we did get her, and she's examining that old photo of Coop against like the evil Coop and doing a fingerprint check. I thought more might come of that here, but I assume we'll get more than that. Like, yeah. what if they don't have the same fingerprints? Like, what's going on here? Like, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I, that also reminds me, like, it's important to note that they did not in any way even address the sort of ending from episode four where, yeah. where Gordon Cole was going to go, like, find some person that knows Coop. Yeah, so who knows? I, I mean, they they cut that scene in such a way that they we thought maybe they're going to Twin Peaks. Yeah. And maybe they are. We don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Of course they didn't address that. We talked about the scene in the bar. Uh, okay, another scene like deepening the mystery and another celebrity role is we got here Mr. Ernie Hudson, Winston from Ghostbusters, yeah. as Colonel, uh, what's it, Colonel, uh, I forget his name, but he's the colonel in this military base. And apparently they have been finding over the years Major Garland Briggs, a character from the original Twin Peaks, yeah. Bobby's father, his prints on different bodies or something and now they found the prints on the body of this murder victim in south dakota yes. and they want to go find out what's going on here so ernie hudson sends his deputy out to do that or something so again like this web is both growing and tightening at the same time yeah that's it because because the actor who played major briggs has been dead for quite a while but i like that even he has some kind of a weird presence in this yeah and it's something where it's going to be really interesting when this is all said and done and seeing like the total cast list for this series because it is a ridiculous number of characters and they get a lot of good like like Ernie Hudson kind of actors for a lot of these roles. Yeah, no, I you recognize so many people and then it doesn't feel gimmicky. They're just good yeah. in the role. Um, like Amanda Seyfried was one where she's a pretty famous actress right now and then she's really good in the scene so it doesn't matter. Uh, there's that scene with the kid across the street from Dougie's house yeah. the drug addict mom. And the, 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 bomb, the car bomb finally goes off. Yeah, he sees this thing on Dougie's car goes over to check it gets caught and they just blow up the car. That escalated quickly. Yes. So that's interesting. Um, let's see. We've talked about the casino scene. Um, yeah, we've talked about most everything. I talked about the, uh, the, the stand-up coroner who I loved. And, of course, the establishing shots are great. So that about covers it for episode five. I mean, you know, there's one scene I should say I didn't like in this episode. And it's the scene where you have uh, Sheriff Truman. Right, yeah. The new Sheriff Truman. Uh, and his wife comes in and is kind of yelling at him. It mostly seems like an excuse to let Robert Forster do reaction shots. And he is good at that. That was a comic scene that fell flat for me. I agree, yeah. It and, was a bit too much. Because especially after... We got a very a sort of similar scene in terms of like the construction with the Michael Sarah character 
um, maybe yeah. three or whatever, of just like you know the the Michael Ankin sign of things just being like ah, I'm not going to react to this, um, yeah. or Robert Forster, uh, Wally Brando, yeah. And so yeah, I agree. That scene just it kind of it just went on too long without ever having like a a really funny moment in there. Yeah. So you know, it one scene I didn't like. Yeah. I liked all the other scenes. Um, we do have one more scene with um, with Hawk in this one. And he had a funny line, and I forget what it was. Oh, yeah, it was, uh, I haven't found any Indians. <laughs> yeah. So, they're still just in that room looking for evidence. We'll see if anything comes of that. Again, this is moving very slowly. But that's, that's the way I want it. It's oh, yeah. moving very slowly, and it's moving at exactly the right pace. Absolutely. I mean, I guess here is the question. Yeah. Do, is Kyle McLaughlin going to play the Dale Cooper we know within the digesis of these 18 Hours of Twin Peaks? I really have no idea. And yeah. that's so amazing that I cannot <laughs> say with confidence that he will ever play a character like closely resembling like the classic Dale Cooper that everybody wants him to play. Yeah. I, you know, I made the joke that uh, when the first four episodes aired that episode three and four felt like if David Lynch did a Doctor Who regeneration story, that's what it would be. You would yeah. have like zombie doctor going around going... Hello! Yeah. And stuff like that. It's gotten to a point now where it's like, this would be if a Doctor Who generation lasted a whole season and he never got better yeah. or something. I don't know. Like, my instinct is that Kyle McLaughlin probably wants to play that character and we do have a lot of hours left. But I just, like, given the pace, I don't know what the thing is that's out there because I don't think it's going to be he's just going to randomly wake up. Yeah. I think something has to happen. I mean, I... somebody has to... The most easy solution would be somebody finds out where he actually is and like which is like has been complicated in the plot of that you have then know that evil cooper is there the fbi do so they're obviously not going to assume that there is actual cooper somewhere out in the world so somebody like i the i guess the most likely solution is like, like the hawk side of things at twin peaks they will find something that clues them in maybe somehow to find cooper because there's the little tiny scene we get with the prostitute that yes. was with dougie where they find the key in the car and she throws it in a mailbox. And that is like maybe the one thing. Who knows? That could be a total red herring. It very likely is. That's like the one thing I feel they have set up that could eventually lead to a chain of events that gets like characters like Andy and, and Hawk and people to find Coop because yeah. those are about the only things that I think could actually like I, resuscitate him. I do think that will come up again. I think that he will get to Twin Peaks and because we already had an establishing scene at the Great Northern yeah, with did, Richard yeah. Bamer as as Ben Horn, so, and you know maybe that's how Audrey comes back from this because Sherilyn Fenn has not appeared yet. She's in this, yeah. She hasn't appeared yet, so yeah, I think all those pieces matter. I think they're going to come together in some form. You know, Gordon Cole and uh, Albert Rosenfield, yeah. Doctor Albert, might be going to Twin Peaks, so things could start converging. Yeah. I don't think it's going to happen quickly. <laughs> no, it's definitely not next, next episode. I'd be surprised if we got Coop Coop. You know, and we, do, and we, I mean, episode to episode also, there's a lot of just thing balls in the air that we haven't seen in a while. Like the Matthew Lillard character from the first two yeah. who uh, is accused of killing those people and, and seems like he probably did it, but we don't know if he was possessed or something. That's got to go. I mean, again, it feels like we're setting up a lot. It also feels like it's not just set up. I think things are going to happen because of this. And again, we're five out of 18 hours, yeah. not even a third of the way in. Yeah, there's there's a lot left to enjoy. Yeah, and uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm really enjoying it. It's so Man. good. All right, well, we will be back next week. We're going to release this on Wednesday again. At least that's the plan. We'll talk about Doctor Who. We'll talk about Twin Peaks. We'll talk about E3. We might split it into two episodes. Who knows? There's a lot to talk to come. There's so much to talk about. I'm very excited to, you know, just utterly destroy my body watching all the E3 press conferences and then, you know, parading my suffering on this podcast for everyone to enjoy. <laughs>